Hello, everybody. Welcome to this show tonight. I'm really excited about this show. Um, we pushed it back just a little bit so we because we wanted to make sure we had everything online sounding good. And we do I already had a little test run with uh, Nikki B and sounded great, looked great. So I'm really excited. So uh, let a few people pop on here on the live chat. See a bunch of patties here. Uh, Mark, how are you? Mark Anthony says Don Cheney is Dan Cooper. And I said uh, two birds with one stone, Mark. <laughs> make it really easy. Uh, I was actually going to bring that up with Nikki uh, about uh, Eric Ulis posted on the DB Cooper research page on Facebook, a document that the, when they were researching DB Cooper, they actually did look at the Zodiac killer. So I thought that was pretty cool. My, if I remember in a little bit, I'm going to um, mention that to Nikki again, because I thought that was pretty funny. So. Just for the, for there's, if there's any newbies out there that aren't familiar, we're going to be talking about D.B. Cooper, the guy that jumped out of a Boeing 727 on Thanksgiving Eve, 1971. So I want to give a little brief background on the case because there's, you know, always somebody that might be traveling the, you know, the World Wide Web, founds, finds this video and they don't know what we're talking about. So I wanted to give a little back. Thank you, Patty. Uh, this is in, in honor of uh, speaking to Billy Wall yesterday, which is a huge highlight of my life, getting to speak to Billy Wall. And we'll, I'm sure I'll talk a little bit about that with Nikki B, but uh, wearing this Mac V Sog shirt for, uh, in honor of Billy Wall. But anyway, let's, uh, I'm going to read this real quick. Some people are still coming online, so I might make it a little bit longer because it takes a while, obviously, to get the notification from YouTube. Sometimes people don't get it at all. Uh, sometimes they get it at, a, you know, a minute or two late. So I see people are coming on because we went from like 10 people in the live chat to 20 in like 30 seconds. There's the Bible group. How are you? D.B. Cooper is one hell of a mystery. Yes. Nobody, you got it right. Buddy, you made it. Yeah, you did make it, buddy. I'm glad you made it. Okay, we're about two minutes in, so I'm going to go ahead. This is going to be the, the quick background on D.B. Cooper. Of course, if there's any newbies out there. And it was the day before Thanksgiving, 1971. A man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane, claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in $20 bills and four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane somewhere over the, somewhere over the Pacific Northwest with the money and the bomb, only leaving behind his black clip-on tie. Remember that. Despite, do, despite dozens of deathbed confessions and over a thousand suspects being interviewed by the FBI, the hijacker's identity is still not known till this day. And that is a brief history on D.B. Cooper. Of course, um, about $5,800 worth of his money was found on a shore of a place called the Tina Bar along the Columbia River in 1980 by an eight-year-old boy named Brian Ingram. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit, too. But without further ado, and I don't know, there he is. I'm going to bring on my guest tonight, and it's Nicholas Broden, otherwise known as Nikki B. How are you, Nikki? I'm doing great. How you doing, Drew? Doing great, man. Good seeing you. It looks like great weather there in Southern California. Yeah, man. I'm just, jealous. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah, just enjoying the weather out here. And thanks, uh, thanks for having me on the Drew Tube, man. I'm looking forward to uh, having a little fun on the Saturday night talking some uh, Cooper with you, man. Yeah, definitely. Because you and I usually we message each other through uh, Facebook Messenger, and and you know you'll send me something. Maybe it's at like ten thirty or eleven o'clock my time, and I always want to see what it is because I know you're like doing research. 24 7 sometimes i mean you must sleep and wake up and hit and hit it hit it hard and i mean i think that's awesome and i have this is one question i had for you that i've never asked you before and it's going to lead to something else but though but uh <laughs> have you ever been skydiving i have not uh been skydiving yet okay so that's, that's on your list you're still young uh me personally i've never gone skydiving i did the indoor skydiving thing and that was a little weird. You have to train in a little group. And by the end of your little session, when you go into the little wind tunnel or whatever the hell it is, and they turn it up a, a decent amount where you could actually kind of get that sensation a little bit. They only do it like right at the end for like five minutes. And then, you know, you got to train a little more. It's been at least four, another 400 bucks. You might be able to really get into it. But that was the only thing I've ever done. But I don't know, man. I'd be the, I'd be the guy that it goes wrong on. But uh, one of the yeah. first, go go ahead. 
Oh no, I, I was just gonna say, yeah, the wind. So, Mar uh, I'm, luckily for me, I'm uh, if I do want to pick up skydiving, I'm right here in kind of the uh, this the epicenter to do it. Uh, I live in Lake Elsinore, California. Uh, there's a there's a drop zone, you know, uh, within a mile from me, and then we also got Paris, which is also very close, which has a very good wind tunnel. And uh, when I was at CooperCon, Mark's like, you know, I told him I was kind of interested in, in in possibly, you know, getting into it. And, uh, you know, mainly because I, I would like to jump uh, the DC-9 that's actually at Paris, California oh, wow. uh, drop zone. So they actually have a DC-9 with the stairs. It's pretty much it's almost the same configuration of the 727. And uh, for a couple of years now, they've been trying to get it up and going. They keep kind of teasing that they're going to get it up. And if they ever do, that's kind of my dream. You know, I would love to jump a 727 just like just like D.B. Cooper. I mean, well, you know, that's like the ultimate way to investigate is actual like do that. Feel exact it. Thing Feeling it. I actually did. You know what I'm saying? That's just like another level. And that just kind of shows like the kind of uh, how kind of uh, fanatic and crazy I am about the case. But. But yeah, man, it's definitely uh, crossed crossed my mind about uh, taking the plunge, you know, jumping uh, out of a perfectly good airplane, as they say. Yeah, I, I hope you do because one of the first things that hit me when I really knew you were like this hardcore, and other people like Darren probably knew it before me about you, but I didn't uh, for you know until I saw the Facebook group Old School Skydiving. I thought, oh, this looks cool. Maybe you can find something about Braden in there, or whatever. And uh, you had to like submit to be a member or whatever. And you were the admin on it that let me in. I was like, man, this dude is everywhere. You're on the old school side having thing. And you're a young guy. I'm like, what is he doing, man? This guy is all over the place. Yeah. And, well, uh, I'm not a, I'm, that was awesome. Think, yeah. I don't think I wasn't, I don't, I'm not an admin on the group, but the way the gr groups work a lot of times, depending on the settings, if, if you're a member and one of your friends requests. Oh, can, that's it. Okay. <laughs> I was giving you more the, credit. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, no. <laughs> thanks for tuning my horn up. But yeah, I wasn't uh wasn't an admin, but yeah, like I've been like uh I've infiltrated this group and that's probably the I've learned more from that Facebook group probably than I have uh than any other Facebook group I've I've come across and there's a few other good ones too. But yeah, that's kind of been one of my uh investigative uh tactics. I know you I saw you were a member of the group as well, or I think I added yeah, you. I, yeah, you added yeah. me. You you added me. You vouch you vouch for my uh never been skydiving in my life credibility. <laughs> but that is a cool site. I found a great picture of Braden on there from that a guy put on there that knew him, and it was from 1959, one of the better photos I have. So it paid off dividends. I mean, for me, just for that one photo, it, it was fantastic that uh, and a guy, he was asking if other people had known him, but whoever the gentleman was that posted the pic is gone, I think, because he posted it like four or five years ago. Uh, but it was a huge payoff. I mean, so that's a great, uh, you know, great way to find stuff. I mean, that's when I knew that you were all over the place when you get into these groups about, you know, the, the SAT and the, uh, you know, all the 727 stuff, the Southern Air Transport groups. And you're talking to guys that, that, uh, that flew the 727 and the 727 mechanics that, that work for Southern Air. And I'm like, man, this dude is hardcore. He's going to like, if anybody breaks this case wide open, I always thought it was going to be you. Cause oh, you're, I mean, you're into all this stuff, man. You're all over Facebook, all over this brother. stuff. And I know we're going to talk about the tie, of course, but uh, you know, the first thing you know about you is I, uh, you know, I knew cause you went on the vortex, I think right before I did the first time I went on the Cooper vortex, which I thought was the greatest thing when a friend pointed that out to me, like, you know, there's this all DB Cooper podcast. I was like, really well this is awesome you know because i started working you know i always loved the case even before i heard about Braden. always a big db cooper fan but i think i think you had done the show right before i did of course you were talking about your suspect um james edward klansnick and i thought oh this is great this guy seems fantastic but uh i know some people got you confused with with the uh with the troll guy you know i think it was his name was Gotsi or something he went by Gotsi 12 and yeah, I was, yeah. you know, and, the, and the, he had, I mean, that guy was nuts and I saw him around some places, but he had some funny pictures. You know, he had the one of Clans Nick and I'll, I'll show that one. Uh, I, I wish I found the, the picture this guy did, but he had a picture of Clan, you know, the famous picture of Clans Nick with, uh, you know, under the with, plane. With the tie. Uh, yeah. And he had the money bag by him. You know, he added the money bags and stuff. That was pretty funny. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm showing that photo right now. So uh, there's James Edward Clansnick. This is Nikki B's top suspect in the Cooper case, and he's done a lot of work on it. But, uh, 
you know, so how did it come? How did it, how did you come by clans? Nick, was it, was it him first or he picked up on what you were doing? Cause I never really knew how that all came about. I always wanted yeah, you know, I always want to know. Yeah. Great question. Uh, I, I kind of talked, talked to us about this on my episode on the vortex a little bit and here and there. So pretty much I mean, me and uh, Derek Godsey got wrapped up with the rack straw investigation. Right. So, right. I was going to bring that up. We can't, we can't uh, pass that up. Yeah. So I, or, or so you maybe start from there. Start if you, if you want to start from there, because obviously you knew a top DB Cooper suspect, uh, Robert Wesley Rackstraw, and just go about that. Cause I, I, that's how you got into the case originally. Yeah. I, I can kick it back from there. So, so, so basically here in Lake Elsinore, uh, I worked at an office, uh, and, uh, in the same building as Robert Wesley Rackstraw, who was, uh, a top suspect back in, well, he was actually a suspect back in the, uh, I think mid seventies. Um, basically, uh, the way Robert Rackstraw came on the FBI's radar is he was on trial for murdering his stepfather and Rackstraw thought he was, he was in for it. He was going to go to the federal penitentiary. So he, he was like, he started freaking out and he's like, He's like, man, how, how do I make, you know, what, what I need some kind of a bargaining chip here or something. So he came up with this whole thing that I'm DB Cooper in hopes that if he gets, you know, uh, a big sentence that we, he won't have to do, he'll, he'll do time in an easier, in an easier spot, basically. Mm. Right. Um, turns out he actually even got more fortunate. His lawyer got him off um, and he, he got let off scot. He got let off scot free, um, but because he originally, when he was in jail, he called up. I, I don't know if it was NBC or the, you can find his original news uh, newscast that I think they showed to Tina. Um, you know where where she said, you know, no, nope, doesn't sound like him. You know that I don't. I don't. It doesn't. It's not, it wasn't the guy I remember. Um, but but yeah, that. That's how he, he originally came on the FBI's radar. And then in 2000 and, uh, 2016, right, I probably had already uh, uh, known Rackstraw for about, I don't know, six months prior, six months prior to that, uh, to that up to that point. And then um, I think it was like June or July that summer, um, I saw that I saw that History Channel documentary. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I always D. B. had D.B. Cooper channel. case closed. DB Cooper Clay's closed. Yeah, I think I was watching like Pawn Stars or like American Pickers <laughs> or something, and I, and I saw the promo come on. I'm like, oh crap, DB Cooper. I remember him from the old Unsolved Mystery days. And then I kind of, <laughs> and then I kind of remembered stuff in the media uh, when uh, Marla Cooper and they said, oh, the best suspect. Mm-hmm. It, it was like all over Fox. L- LD, yeah. It was like kind of like all over Fox News, and I was like, oh yeah, dude. I was like, I remember that crazy guy from Unsolved Mysteries, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then 2016 again i'm like oh crap i'm the guy from unsolved mysteries again and they're like and and this guy they're pointing at robert rackstraw and i'm like holy crap what in the hell right <laughs> so you didn't even know when you knew rackstraw you didn't you didn't know he was a suspect no for db cooper no i just knew he was a crazy vietnam vet man and he was uh he had just gone through uh through cancer through some chemo mm-hmm. and and at the uh at the time i was uh I was partnered up with the guy uh, and I was growing, I was growing some cannabis and um, that's how we kind of became acquainted. You know, one time out, you know, I was smoking out, I was smoking out of the office on break and he's like, you know, what you got there. And we kind of struck up a conversation that way. And then whenever I was on a smoke break or something, you know, we would talk, he'd tell me stories, uh, crazy stories. And, you know, uh, the, the guy was the the guy was uh he was an interesting character man i mean he was uh he was just it, it's just kind of hard to kind of hard to explain him exactly with words but i mean yeah, he, I definitely, he was out there he was he was he was definitely yeah. different like a lot of these suspects are i mean all these suspects in the cooper case are you know they're all uh like characters out of central casting every one of them i mean from from uh barb dayton to on the down on down the line yeah, Rackstraw, Rackstraw was a true one, man. Uh, but yeah, so like six months, you know, after, you know, I just, you know, casual relationship, started selling, uh, me and my buddy started selling some weed to him. And, you know, we just had that kind of relationship going on. And then that summer I saw that, uh, 
I saw that docu, and I'm like, holy freaking smoke! You just man. flew out of your chair, probably. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what in the hell is going on here? So I'm like, and, and um, like me at that point, I had no, um, I had uh, no investigate, like I hadn't investigated the case. Um, you know, I just had a kind of passing interest. Like I, I had no idea the TV mm-hmm. Cooper forum existed, the drop zone existed, you know, I had no idea of all the interest, all the intricacies of the case and everything that was kind of involved and entailed, you know, but that kind of nudged me into, you know, kind of set me into the vortex, so to speak. And I just, I got caught up in the forces from there. Mm-hmm. Right. And so- not knowing anything in the beginning, I thought, Hey, rack straw, you know, he's probably the guy, you know, the way he lined mm-hmm. up, you know, he's got all these guys on his cold case team. I won't get into, you know, all, all the details or, I, you know, I can be here for a long time and get into other things, but, but, you know, it, it looked really good on paper. And then, you know, I, I started my own investigation in Iraq straw, you know, Colbert wanted me to work for him. I was kind of like, all right, I'll, I'll help you yeah. out. He kind of did some shady stuff with me, whatever. I'll help you out. But I kind of yeah, acted like I was helping him out. But that, at that point, I was already interested in the case. So I was just kind yeah, of- Yeah, you, you wanted to know the truth. I mean, you weren't yeah, interested exactly. in just framing, framing you know, him. Yeah, you know, Rackstraw so was- may, may have done a lot of wrong, but if he wasn't Cooper, you weren't interested in just like shoot, you know, like the square, square peg in the round hole thing. Exactly. So in the beginning, I was kind of playing both sides of the fence, you know, just to trying to see, you know, what, you know, I didn't want to tell Colbert. Yeah. Like even at first, I didn't, when I, when I wasn't thinking it was Rackstraw anymore, I still didn't tell him, yeah, I don't think it's, you know, I was still kind of, you know, just trying to see, you know, just, just trying to see what more information I could get. But like when Colbert started I, getting desperate and asked me to actually uh, plant evidence on Rackstraw and like start doing some shady stuff like that. I was like, if, if this was really D.B. Cooper, he wouldn't be, need to be doing this. And uh, yeah, so he was just de- he was desperate to, to uh, at least in the eyes of the media, be proven right. Exactly. So in my process of vetting Rackstraw after that whole thing, because like I said, at first I was like, man, I really think it's Rackstraw. But then, I, you know, I went online, I saw the forums and people were like shooting him down right away, you know, because so I didn't yeah. know. His, I didn't know. He wasn't height. middle. He wasn't middle age, uh, you know, the, the, the easier stuff. And he was really you know, he was pretty violent, wasn't he? I mean, maybe not when you knew him, but I know from his past, he was really violent. Of course, a lot of these guys were, but unfortunately but you right. know so like he you know i've talked i've talked to one of his ex-wives that has confirmed you know domestic type of things and you know he's had five or six i think uh six ex-wives so you know like i said he was most people believe he did murder his stepfather uh the guy you know he was he seemed like he was he he was kind of like he can be the nicest guy one minute and then like you can see like a churn like he'll just yeah, he'll be like snaps a light. or something yeah, I'll just notice that like he'll be just cool, jovial, telling me stories, laughing, and then something will just, you know, something will annoy him or irk him, and he'll just boom. So I didn't see like the level-headed coolness. That was another like one reason why I wasn't liking him just from my interactions, like and learning more. So like I said, at first I didn't know like, you know, I didn't know his age, like I didn't know all of the real specifics. But when I got on the mm-hmm. forum and started doing research and started, you know, actually learning the specifics, and kind of you know understanding the actual profile of Cooper, I'm like, man, it doesn't really match up with Rackstraw, but I'm like, Hey, you know, I, I kind of give things the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, well, you know, you know, maybe, you know, war age, uh, maybe, the, you know, so yeah, I'm like, I, 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 gotta or... know, I gotta know more. Like, you know, th- you know, Colbert did do a lot of work and there is all this stuff. So I still got to dig in more. So at that point I was like, I was like, man, uh, I need to do a little bit more to kind of get, inside with Rackstraw because you got to realize at the uh, at the point the documentary came out he was like really on guard right because he got am mm-hmm. like he got ambushed. oh yeah they were they got ambushed where he, the, yeah he lived on a houseboat right yeah he would sleep he would sleep there a lot he actually had a boat in um in coronado called poverty sucks and he would he would sleep there a lot <laughs> Um, or at his office i think he was kind of in between like for a while he, he didn't actually have a um an actual place, to, uh, an actual home. So he was either like sleeping at his office here in Elsinore or he was sleeping on his boat. But yeah, like mm-hmm. they ambushed saw that video, like where they just ambushed him at the Marina that one time. Yeah. That, uh, that was which bad. Was, which was just ridiculous. Yeah, I, mean, I felt sorry for him when I saw that. I really did. Yeah, I felt yeah. sorry for him. And when that show came on at that point in my, in my, you know, I knew the case from a long time from in search of, and then as you mentioned on solved mysteries, but when that show came on, I, and I hadn't read the book last master outlaw, which is the book about Rackstraw by 
Tom Colbert. It was this this uh, this show called uh, DB Cooper Case Closed. When I when I remember that show coming on, I was hoping they solved it. I, I thought the guy looked interesting, well, yeah. so I was like, I was hoping they solved it. But they got with it. You know, after the first hour, you're like, you could just see how convoluted it got. And it like you and I have talked about before when they first told the story about the money maybe being planted on Tina Bar and the Ingrams and that story about hey, see that old hippie couple over there. Uh, they're gonna find some money uh, along the Columbia River, and then in the, the, then on the news two days later, the people saw it. You know, they saw the Ingrams on the news, so that was intriguing. It really was. That kind of got me into it a little bit. Right. No, but after had, the first hour, it went. It just fell to pieces with this barren de winter crap, and it just got so convoluted and heavy. I was like, ah. It was a total clickbait situation. Like before clickbait, before really clickbait became, you know known as clickbait that's kind of what they did to us you know they led with that good punch about the money find where they yes. didn't expect you to start with and you're like oh yeah they had you thinking right away oh the money was planted oh this could explain it all right yeah yeah and it's like but then after that it's just like the story it just you know it, it just it just fell apart kind of like you know they did the same thing with zodiac with the watch like oh yeah this military watch they try to you know they try to throw that watch in front of you but then what, what do you got after that really nothing and it's like you know and yeah, even the fell, original piece of evidence is like, yeah it falls apart real quick so i kind of got the gist of you know i was real disappointed because you know i was like man they got all these cold you got they got all these guys ex-feds and you know this team looked very impressive yeah, so i'm like you know mm -hmm. not knowing i'm like man these guys you know i kind of gave them just the, the benefit of the doubt based on just, you know, the resume, you know, and I thought these guys were actually doing general work, but as I got into the weeds, I'm like, uh, you know, I, the true colors kind of came out of what Rackstraw and his investigative team were about. I mean, they're, they're really just, they're trying to put out product, like just productions, just, you know, just stuff to get views, you know, they're not really true crime cold case, you know, uh, solvers, you know, they don't, I don't see them really doing any hardcore investigative work. Like what I, what I went into immediately, you know, to try to really see if Rakshar was the real deal. So that's how I got hooked up with Derek Godsey. So I had this idea one night when I was watching the show catfish on MTV. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it's that show where, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of it. Someone pretends yeah. to be somebody else online. So I just got this random idea that popped in my head. Because, like I said, Rackshaw at that point, he wasn't really telling me stuff. And I was, you know, I wasn't comfortable asking him too many questions at that point, getting him suspicious of me. You know, I still wanted to keep my relationship. So I had to play this really smart. So I came up with this idea of catfishing Rackstraw. And at the time, Derek Godsey was also working with Colbert. And oh, see, I, I didn't know that. I did not know that. Yes. So I don't know exactly how they came in. He started doing some stuff online for, for Colbert. Um, and <clears throat> we got uh, through Colbert, we got, we got hooked up. So I forgot exactly, exactly how I became acquainted with him. I think maybe on the DB, DBC forum. And he mentioned that he was, he was doing something for Colbert and I, and I reached out to him. I'm like, you know, and we both started kind of, you know, uh, comparing notes, you know, on kind of, you know, what, you know, what Colbert has been telling us, you know, kind of our experiences with Colbert. And I came up with this idea and I'm like, cause I see, I saw Derek online and I saw that, he, you know, this guy is real enthusiastic. Like this guy's down and down to do some stuff. So I'm like, I just threw this idea at him just kind of like almost as a little joke, but he took it and ran with it. I'm like, you know, why don't we catfish, catfish rack straw? Like let's make a nice mm -hmm. little, middle-aged woman and let's let's see if he'll talk to us because i knew his one weakness was women. Uh, was women because you know all of his wives and whenever i see him interact with women in the in the office setting whenever a gal walked by that was you know good looking yeah was, whistling and saying stuff and he was one of those guys exactly yeah. you know trying to pick up on her so i'm like man this would be the perfect move on rack straw and maybe we can get him to spill some kind of beads you know i'm like it's mm -hmm. a long it's a long shot but hey you know you miss yeah, 100%. It's worth the try. Yeah, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? So mm -hmm. I, I all just kind of said it like half jokingly to, to, uh, to Derek. And then he just kind of, next thing I knew, he had a profile up and he's already sending me screenshots of their convos. And I'm like, holy crap. And he's sending them like X, like army picks, stuff that Colbert's never gotten. Um, wow. So he was yeah. into the good stuff because he, because he, uh, uh, Rackstraw thought this was a woman that, that was interested in him. 
He oh, totally yeah. took it. Oak line and sinker. Oak line and sinker. So, um, so we were, you know, we were trying to bait him for information, but it just like he he said he said uh, he had a uh, what was funny he said in the paper bag he had a, a model airplane in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. Now I get it. Now I get it because I've I've seen a reference to that before, and I didn't get it because I, I never heard yeah, that whole we were story. Yeah, we like, "What?" We asked him, "What was in that paper bag?" And he's like, "Oh, I had a mo-, He's like, "I had a model airplane." Yeah, so like, like it must have been this tiny because it was a little bitty sack that they said DB Cooper had, right? And Bill Mitchell said he kept putting his left hand in and out of that little paper bag. Well, no, um, Bill Mitchell said he was putting his hand in and out of the briefcase where the bomb was. The paper bag has a couple different descriptions from smaller to larger to in between. Mm-hmm. Um, but we know is it like it was darker in color, so it was like either yellowish or, or brown or like a, even a green. Um, and it didn't have any handles, it didn't have any markings or anything like that on it. And then the size, like everything else, uh in the case we have we have different eyewitness or you know, we don't even know who said who because most of the stuff's redacted in the files. But there's right. different reports. There's different reports in the files on the paper bag as far as the size and everything like that. You know, I speculated that there was boots in there. Like, I think it was a decent sized bag. I don't think it was an itty bitty bag. That's mm-hmm. where I think. That's where I was like, eh. You know, I think he was just, you know, that comment of he was just playing around with us. And and Rackshaw would do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. And for people I've I've talked to around him, he he liked the attention of it. Oh yeah, he seemed like he did. Um, I, I used to see him. I mean, I never conversed with him, but I used to see him on there. He was under Airborne Bob a lot, or Airborne Bob on Twitter, yeah, and, and face. Uh, he had an Airborne Bob handle on Twitter. He was on Facebook. You know, that's that's how that's how we got to him when we catfished him. Uh, but yeah, pe- like you know, friends and family would you know people that I talked you know that I talked to in his circle would say he would joke about it in parties and stuff like that. How he was, you know, DB Cooper. He'd make little wink and nod jokes, stuff like that. But um, you know, I don't really. Th- if I don't think DB Cooper, there's a reason why he's never apprehended. And that's because he never talked about it. So it just everything just did. After we talked to Ragstraw, it, you know, and fu- and just kind of confirmed, you know, how much of not really a gentleman he is with the ladies and. Mm-hmm. his age and everything i just learned i was like yeah, yeah you know and the fbi look had already looked at him i mean way before colbert caught on didn't the fbi didn't the fbi ruled him out twice like, i mean yeah, like, like way that. before colbert got a hold of him like i said yeah and rackshaw was the one that put him like i mentioned before rackshaw was the one that put himself on the radar mm-hmm. because he called up first the fbi hadn't even looked at him yet i don't think until he called up um until he called up NBC or whatever and 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 did that that video recording in jail saying, you know, I'm DB Cooper. Until then, I don't believe he was on the FBI's radar that I've seen in the files or anything like that. So he wow. put himself on the radar. So it's like yeah, he wanted he wanted the yeah, the recognition and yeah, at, at that time I think he was just kind of desperate for a sweeter spot. But I'm just like, if you're DB Cooper, you're not ever gonna mention it. I just don't think. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, Not, just didn't line up with what you were reading about Cooper and in the files. Just didn't line up with the Rackstraw. They said he was perfect. Tina said he was a perfect gentleman, which that's not Robert Rackstraw. He's not a perfect gentleman. I mean, would Rackstraw be the kind of guy that would order uh, uh, meals for the flight crew or offer the uh, nope. stewardess money? Have, he didn't. He didn't have that thoughtfulness. You know, I did. Yeah. I never. I never seen him do one thoughtful thing with my with my interaction with him. Not once. So, mm-hmm. you know. Again, you know, it's it's little things, but when you're, you know, when you're trying to determine candidacy for a suspect, it's, you know, it's going to kind of be kind of finite like that. You yeah. Know? Unless unless you want to believe the guy put on an Academy Award performance. Yeah. Which, which doesn't know, line up with him either. You know? Just, you know, someone can say that, you know, that's just that's anything is possible. But, yeah. you know, if Cooper was comfortable uh, I think he was kind. Of, he was mo- he was being himself. You know, he was being himself, dressing like himself. You know, he wasn't doing anything outside of his norm. And I think that right, showed, he was comfortable. I think that showed in all of his uh, interactions and behaviors and everything like that. You know, the age and you know, it just you know. And he was clean. Like, I mean, he was he was he was clean, getting the notes back and all this kind of stuff. And and Rackstraw had a, a long record for. You know, he got off of the thing for killing the father-in-law, but he got busted he for like a million time. other things. Right. He staged he his own death. Time. Didn't he try to stage his own death? Yeah. He tried to he stage got, his own death. He faked, he faked a mayday. He faked a, a, a mayday. 
uh, yeah, the, the when he faked his death, he faked a mayday. So he flew a private plane somewhere and acted like, and jumped. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if he jumped out or exactly, but he, he acted like a, he crashed or he might have just flew somewhere else. But he acted like the plane crashed, like he was gone. And then uh, uh, he was at, it was eventually apprehended for that. Um, he was writing fake, I think, fake checks. He was doing some kind of financial frauds caught for that. So, you know, everything I've seen Rackshaw do, he got caught up for. Um, yeah, he wasn't. He was. He was a good helicopter pilot. He was pretty daring and nom, from what I know. But he wasn't smart enough not to get yeah, caught. He, and he certainly yeah. wasn't smart enough to do Norjack or come up with the idea of a briefcase bomb. I mean, that that took some brains. Whoever came up with it, Rackshaw strikes me as a guy that he would have been more McCoy style and just you know, yeah, gun gun grenade. That's more. That yeah, both more helicopter like, pilots. That seems more of just like the uh, just like the lazy like military style. You know, yeah. What I'm saying? But yeah, Not so like once, once I just eliminated Rackstraw, um, then I was like, man, I was already learned so much about the case. I'm like, well, what do I do now? I'm like, you know, I was kind of like at a loss, you know, because I at first, like I said, I, you know, I was really hyped up and I was like, man, I'm like, man, imagine if I actually met D.B. Cooper, like this whole thing would be so cool. So, you know, I, I was kind of deflated at the end of this thing. Uh, but I had learned a lot about the case. So I'm just like, man, and like, well, if I were to keep looking where would I start? That's what I asked myself. So I just kind of started thinking about the main criteria. Um, like the things that, you know, I hold, like I hold as the most like telling evidence. Right. And that's his knowledge of the aircraft, the 727. That's, that's the real, that's the real big one for me. Um, and then, is that how you wound up, uh, getting into Klansnick or was, was that, did Gotsi find Klansnick first, or did you, or where, or where did where did Klansnick come from? I'm always interested in where someone got on the radar. Right. So we started with people that would have knowledge of the 727, right? So that's that's where we started our search. So me and Derek, we've been, you know, kind of like I collaborate with you and a bunch of the other guys mm-hmm. in, in the vortex. We're sharing information, um, and <laughs> I'm like, man, like we got to start looking at, at guys that actually knew the 727, knew these aft stairs can be lowered in flight, knew that it can be taken, let no knew that it can take off with the aft stairs. Yeah, which was which was pretty forbidden knowledge. I mean, the pilots didn't even know it, right? I've got a picture of the of a Boeing 727 next to the one with with a picture of uh, James yeah. Edward Klansnick, but you can see the the, the aft stairs on the plane. If people don't know, that's what the Boeing 727 had that unique feature. And and that that plane could take off with that stare down, right, Nikki? And then and a lot of the pilots didn't know that the plane could actually take off with the aft stare down. Right. They had to call. They had to call Boeing. You know, that's that's who re- reassured them. But they were more freaked out. Actually, yeah, they were they were freaked out too. They were very scared about the plane taking off with the stairs down. They fought Cooper. There was a back and forth. You know, Cooper wanted the stairs down on takeoff, and they didn't think it was safe. Right. Boeing kind of, you know, I don't know exactly. Boeing told me it would still be safe to fly with the air stairs down, but they told him you can lower the stairs in flight. It'll be okay. You can fly in. You can fly in the sky with the air stairs down. Um, as far as taking off with them down, maybe they they didn't get as much reassurance there. Um, because who would really know that? Because who's who's going to test the seven twenty seven taking Someone off with that knew the stairs it. down? <laughs> That's gonna da- that's gonna freaking damage it. So it's like I don't think there's any there was no practical test, or I don't think anyone's ever seen uh I don't think no one's ever taken off with the 727 with the stairs down until Denong, where mm-hmm. that 727 it actually proved what DB Cooper was was right because there wasn't any of the aft stair tests I've seen. They never actually performed the test taking off with the stairs down and dragging, you know, on the uh, on the runway Mm -hmm. uh, like it did in the Denong. So you can YouTube it. Seven twenty seven Denong, Denong, Thailand. What what year was that? What what year was that in in Thailand that they were doing those? Seventy. So um, this happened, I think, mid I think mid 70s. So okay, it, so it, that so was it, after the hijacking. It was it was after. But it shows you what how it's how it gives you a demonstration of what it what it what it would do. So it it showed you that the seven twenty seven could actually take off with the stairs down, and not only were the stairs down, they had just like you see in this picture here, they had more than those folks, and they were all on the stairs, and they were hanging, they were grabbing onto it, um, and the plane 
took off with with all of that. I think it blew it blew like, something like, too. Oh wow! Uh, it, yeah, it speaks to the durability of the seven twenty seven. I mean, it's one of the most rugged and durable aircrafts there is, man. So, so uh, obviously Co- Cooper wanted it down because he didn't want to have to worry about getting it down once he was in flight, right? I mean, that'd be the, the best reason that Cooper wanted it down because he knows knew it would be an easy exit. I mean, other than maybe Cooper had experienced before or knew about uh, some 727s that had trouble lowering the stairs. And like, as we know, he asked uh, Tina Mucklow to help him lower the stairs while they were in flight. So maybe he had been in a couple of situations where the stairs wouldn't, you know, you couldn't, you know, lower them down while you were in flight. So he yeah. knew the safest way to was take off with it already down. I don't know. Yes, that's that's a great point, Drew, and that's that's exactly what I believe. That's why that's why I think he wanted him down. People could point to he wanted to jump early. I also think he wanted to jump relatively early. Um, I don't necessarily think he wanted to jump right there in Seattle because that's kind of right there where you're taking off from. But I think he knew the staff stairs were going to be problems. You know, I think from past experience, right? Mm-hmm. Or just you know, just from his knowledge of the aircraft and the hydraulics and the aerodynamics and everything like that, he knew those stairs were going to be a little bit of a problem. They were going to take some time. They're going to take. Yeah. They were going to take some. Of, they were going to take up some of his time uh, to to mess with. Now, I, I believe the whole the whole aft stairs thing came after he already got his money, which he got not in his knapsack which he already had another concern and he was already irked and he's like, okay, I'm going to have to use some time to tie off this net, tie off this canvas bag because the open top is exposed. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause they so, brought him, they, they didn't bring it in what he asked for. He wanted the right, nap stack and it was a bank bag. Right. And I believe, I don't know the exact, I have to go back and look at the exact timeline, but off the top of my head, I want to say that he got the money first before they started, before he said, okay, I want to go to Mexico. Um, I believe he got the money first. Then he said, I want to go to Mexico city. Yeah. So, and then they started the back and forth about the, the, the stairs did, down and didn't have enough fuel to make it to Mexico city. And... Right. And then they, and I think Cooper, you know, he knew the stairs were good. Like he pointed out and he knew that it was going to be a little bit of a problem. So he was just like, you know, I want them down just so I, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to mess with them. Um, you know, it turns out he did have a problem. You know, he had to call Ratichak on the phone and Ratichak had to lower uh, had to lower the plane a little bit more and slow down a little bit more uh, because he couldn't get the stairs down enough. And then once Ratichak corrected the airplane, then he yeah, got it. So then he th- then he got it down enough. So, it, yeah, it wasn't was, an easy thing to do. It was it wasn't easy. I mean, probably in most things that, that, that Cooper knew that it, it, if he had done it before or someone told him about it must have said that it doesn't always work the way you want as far as getting the stairs down in flight. Right. So I looked at that as Cooper was trying to be a little bit ahead of the game there. Um, and, <clears throat> um, and you know, and it, again, it just points to the 727 knowledge because before then we did, there's been no documented evidence. They didn't do any test, any test flights with actually taking off with those stairs down and dragon. And then we see it happen in Denong those years later. So we knew DB Cooper was right. The plane could actually do that. Take off. Yeah. Take yeah. off with the stare down. So yeah, he and the pilots didn't even know that. The pilots did not know that could be done. And they were and they and refused. Cooper did. And they were so afraid they refused to do it. And, and Cooper was just like, no, nah, it's fine. Like he just knew that this this plane, like it speaks to someone, you know, that intimate knowledge. He knew this this plane was rugged, the, st- the stairs were fine, it wouldn't be an issue. And it was proven. It was proven by uh, what what happened in Denong. Um, so yeah. So like I said, I, you know, kind of knowing all of that, I went right into Boeing engineers. Uh, I I figured those those guys would have the most uh, direct knowledge, knowledge of the aircraft. Yeah. Because that's who that's who uh, Northwest Operations called. They called they called Boeing commercial Boeing. airplanes. So I I wanted to go look at the place they called to learn to you know confirm this to learn this information so did you were you looking through yearbooks or online or or? yeah looking through yearbooks looking through obituary so i would just type in i would just type in boeing engineer uh boeing engineer find a grade boeing engineer obituary boeing engineer 1960s just typing in just different keywords and seeing you know what kind of hits i would get and then just through one of my uh one of my plugins came up this article 
on the Boeing 727. It was called a Hydraulics More and Better. And it's by a, a Hydraulics Pneumatics magazine. Uh, it was a 19, I think a July 1964 issue. And, you know, I'm reading this, I'm reading this thing, right? And I'm like, oh man, I'm like, I'm learning some new things, you know, about the aircraft. Cause at the same time, you know, I was, you know, I wanted to also learn some more stuff about everything the you could, everything I could exactly. So I'm like, oh, so I, I didn't even think I was like, you know, it's not like I was reading, you know, bit or anything. I was like, I didn't think I was looking for a suspect here. I was just kind of getting a better understanding on how, how the air stairs worked. And then um, as I get down to almost the bottom of that article, um, I see this picture that you have right here uh, on the right, on the right slide of this guy wearing uh, a black clip on tie, darker complexion, uh, you know, uh, the darker hair, uh, you know, looking, looking pretty good. Like the sketch. Yeah, right he's got, he's, he's got that madman look, you know, he's got that, he's got that retro vintage, you know, that retro uh, kind of lean, you know, and lean. Right, he's got the right, which the by the descriptions were, you know, he was, you know, he was fit, uh, yeah, you know, kind of athletic, you know, would slender, be a term we'd use today. Slender, fit, lean, yeah, which, which, you know, I, I have, I have, uh, Clancic, uh competing in the, uh, in the senior Olympics in his eighties, skiing until his nineties, you know. So this was real this active, was, yeah, yeah. This was an active, fit dude, and by the description of Cooper. You know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't no, no bigger, no bigger guy. You know, he was in, yeah, he was, he was, pretty, he was, yeah, he, was, he, was he wasn't, a, he wasn't a scrawny, you know, shrimp either, and he wasn't a bodybuilder and he wasn't a super big guy, but, but yeah, but just um, kind of, kind of lean and, and, and with some muscle, you know, without being bulky. Exactly. And, you know, the, when I looked at his height and, and uh, height, you know, weight, everything like that matched up, I'm like, okay. Uh, I know the guy. I know the guy's wearing uh, wears black clip on ties. He matches the description, so you know I find his obituary from that from that uh, article on pneumatics and uh, hydraulics, and then I read how he's uh, a World War II fighter pilot, flew uh, B seventeen and was B-17 shot down. Pilot, over, yeah. yeah, and he was shot down over Steyr, Austria. And uh, he exited his, the Bombay shaft along with the rest of his men. And they all made it safely uh, in the ground. I believe uh, he jumped, uh, the jump was from about 20,000 feet. Uh, the plane, the plane was uh, shot, was uh, engulfed in flames. It was shot up pretty bad from, uh, from, from what I read. And, uh, you know, unknown territory. Uh, the, the type of gear they had back then was super heavy. So he had, he had a lot of weight on him. Um, and the weather wasn't good and, uh, they were, he was able to, uh, to parachute down, you know, he probably never ha- had anything more than like, you know, classroom training. Um, most of those fighter pilots back then, that's pretty much what they had. Um, so he was suc- successfully able to pull his rip cord, get down to the ground. And then in unknown territory, they were him and his crew were actually able to um, evade the German forces uh, for almost two whole days uh, before they were finally captured, and then uh, taken to Stalag Luft One, uh, where Klanzig was a POW for 13 months. So I read wow. all of that, and I'm like, "Well, man, I'm like this guy's Great battle. Story. I'm like this guy's battle hardened." Um, one one thing I look at is someone that wouldn't be afraid to do this right that would have exerted this calm cool demeanor that we saw him exert yeah like he had been through all that you know bailing out being a pow for 13 months like bruce says it he's like you you know you gotta have yeah you had had to have a set of cojones but it's like you just you're just not but calm too but calm you know not just amped up and you know i'm gonna do this kind of thing right just totally calm totally in tune with his emotions. You know, a lot of that, you know, most, most human, you know, most regular people, if they're in that situation, they'll show, they'll show some aptness. Like you said, you know, they'll, you know, they'll show some emotions and feelings. So it's just like, it, it tells me that Cooper's seen this and done this before. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it's something he's seen and he's done. He, he's up, op- he's operating in, where he's where he's comfortable and that's that's how we that's what how we see him act so and i'm looking for someone that 
you know, like Bruce says, you have to have, you have to have a set of cojones and, you know, I don't think you just, you don't just grow. I mean, you just don't have, you just don't magically get a set of cojones. Like you gotta, you gotta grow them. Like you gotta have life experiences exactly, to, get, yeah. to, get these, to get these pair of cojones on you. You know, and that's that's why I like you know and experience. Day. And he was he was middle age. I mean, you know, like everybody said, Cooper was you know middle age. That's why you know even these younger guys, you know, Rackstraw had seen combat, of course, so was McCoy, but they were 27, 28 respectively. But you know, the you know Cooper just seemed like they had that more more miles under him. You know, what exactly? And that's why I like about both of our suspects is because they're they're they fit that mold of you know being in that age range, having more miles on you and having those life experiences. Right. So like with, with Braden, it's like, he has more, he has more than enough. A uh, classic really only had one, but I think that's really all it, all it really, all it really needed. Um, but it, the main point is both of these guys wouldn't have flinched at this. They wouldn't have been scared. Of, they wouldn't have been scared. They wouldn't have been nervous. They wouldn't have been emotional. They would have been how DB Cooper would have been. And that's something I'm looking for. So when I read this in his obituary, I'm like, man, I'm like, he shows evasion. He did something. He did a jump harder than this, you know. So he's got the life. He's got the life experience. He wouldn't. He wouldn't be scared, or nervous about doing this. So that just got me digging more. And the more and more I looked, you know, the more I'm looking for for some kind of, uh, you know, a fly in the ointment. You know, was he too short? Did he have the wrong, you know? Uh, wrong set of eyes, even though that's, you know, I, who knows if really anyone got a good, you know, Cooper, but I started really trying to nitpick, you know, cause that's kind of what you got to start doing. Yeah. Start, get the bats. That's what I've always done. You know, with Braden get the, I always get the, anything that's negative against him out first one. I can't even put him, I can't even put him in Washington state or, or, uh, Oregon. Right, uh, right. you know, he's shorter, he's shorter than the witness descriptions. And I, I throw that out first and I said, well, right. if that didn't scare you off now, let's start with the good stuff. And, you know, somebody that, that, you know, I won't name names that likes Richard Floyd McCoy as a suspect will never give you anything negative. It's all, it's, it's him, it's him. I never give you anything, you know, there's nothing negative about him. Forget about his ears or every, anything else or the fact that he had a, a North Carolina accent, which no one reported, you know, but you should, so, you know, like I do, just be honest, just put it out there and, uh, you know, yeah. and then, then, then get into the, the, the positives. Yeah, and what's crazy about Klansnick, because I look at suspects on the daily, you know, just to just to kind of learn and refine the process, and it's like it's the complete opposite. It's like, uh, it's like you don't have to start with the good. You don't have to start with the good stuff to then say, oh yeah, well, you know, you might have been t- too short. You know, there's a couple hitches here and there. It's like, it's like he he passes every single hurdle. You know, all of that. So it's just like you know he he matches up all the all the way down the line. And then it just goes to stuff that's not evidence based, right? So like, why why would he do it? He had a good had job a good job, home. yeah, that whole thing. Yeah, job. he had you know six. He had family six man, children. family man. He was uh, he was very he was very generous. You know, gave you know gave to uh, uh, gave to the churches and bread runs and all this kind of stuff. You know, a pillar in the community, and it's like. You know, it's like I, I understand that, but I, you know, I just have to, I just have to look at the I just have to look at the evidence. You know, motive you can't you yeah, can't get that's inside a really any, hard one. You, you can't get inside anybody's head. You know, there's people that that do things that you just don't exactly know. You know what yeah, goes on what goes on behind closed doors at the as they say. You know, you don't. There's so many people that just like wow, like with all these like crazy you know, true crime murders and stuff. Are, you know, how many times are people shocked? Like, wow, I would have never thought he would have, you know, this guy. Yeah. Would've. The, the yeah. neighbors are stunned. You know, they're like, the it, and it's always, I know, right? I, and it's always, he's the nicest guy in the world. It's never he's like, Oh, I knew that demon. I knew that demon was going to get caught from as being a serial killer one day. I right? mean, I've and never heard anyone say the opposite other than, Oh, I just, I was so shocked. He's the nicest guy in the world. You know, right. other than Joseph D'Angelo, the uh, Golden State killer, I think the people said he was kind of an a-hole of a neighbor. But outside of that, it's always he's the nicest guy in the world. Right. And it's like we're seeing it more with these, you know, with these cases now that are being solved by forensic genealogy. And you just see these guys that just they're finally getting picked up now. But they just they just hid back in plain sight, went back to their regular lives. And, you know, nobody really knew they were a, a crazed, you know, a crazed killer. Yeah, so you I know, mean, so it's like the yeah, I point to the Vegas shooter a lot. It's like the FBI closed that case. Oh yeah, I like, love that. 
we're like, yeah, we don't really know why the guy did it. I think we just maybe think for fame or notoriety, he wanted to be like somebody like his dad or, you know, they had some, it's just like, okay, well, hey, you know, like I said, you just kind of go, got to go by with the evidence. So I, I understand that argument against Klancic, but it's like, you can't really, you can't really knock him down on that. You know, you just, I, the way I took it is I just kind of rethought it. I'm like, what we're talking about now, well, Klanzik would have been able to go back to his regular life. Nobody would have really, nobody would have suspected him. Who's going to, who's going to suspect Klansnik, right? The guy at church. Yeah, goal, no, he, pillar of the community. <laughs> no one's going to, so we're looking for, because I think any of the guys that were in the FBI crosshairs that someone tipped them off, uh, you know, if it was really something to it, they would have uh, gotten to the bottom of it. Right. So I don't think it was, you know, it was someone that no one ever would have thought to tip the FBI on, you know? So, you know, he would have been perfect to go back to his regular life um, and just, you know, just blend in. Um, So that. it explains why you know all all that time went by and you know no one's uh, no one's discovered who, who the guy was. I think it's more along the lines of the guy just went kind of back to his regular life and he had a position in the community that he wasn't like a criminal. No, you know they were looking for criminals and people of that ilk, and you know he would have never came across their radar. Yeah, like like you said, hiding in plain sight, and and that brings us to what we're really going to talk about, which ties perfectly into Klansnick and Boeing was when the a group called the Citizen Sleuths uh, started examining D.B. Cooper's tie that they had access to. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you know this so well, but originally it was Tom Kay who had to, headed up the Citizen Sloops, had an electron microscope, and he found a few uh, interesting items on D.B. Cooper's tie that they let him uh, examine it, or take uh, samples from with sticky tape from the uh, field office in this, Seattle or Portland, where, where that office was. It was, it was Portland. Yeah, I, I think actually the first time, um, maybe that maybe they brought the stuff to Tom in Arizona. Um, I, I'm not, or it might have been in the, uh, the F, they might have sent it to the FBI Arizona lab. I think, I, I think, think you're were, right. I think they did bring maybe they because I remember him getting it wasn't the money. I think maybe you're, you're right that they did send him like by FedEx or something. It was some like with story about how they actually sent it to him and he was kind of surprised how he got it or something. Yeah, he can start his analysis on the tie particles, right? But yeah, but at any rate, yeah. So Tom got uh got uh initially access to the tie um through through Larry Carr and the FBI, and he took these sticky tapes and he put them to the tie and um was trying to collect particles off them to test later on his electron microscope. And that is that that's when he first found the titanium, which was the you know, which was uh was Tom before they sent it off to Macron Labs, right? I mean Macron Macron's the one that did that really deep dive with that heavy power electron microscope that identified like just some insane amount of, of exotic metals, rare earth elements and all this kind yeah. of stuff. But it was Tom that, that first found the pure titanium but but when the titanium was found they knew that there wasn't a whole lot of that obviously in 1971 so i'm sure when you first heard about the titanium being found on the tie you're thinking boeing 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 right yeah uh you know that's uh, i was just like oh man you know i was like this you know i i because I, I at that time i hadn't like i said i was still getting into the case so i hadn't even delved into tom k's uh work yet too deeply but then after I, you know, kind of, all right, I'm going to go start digging into Klansnick and I saw the tie, I'm like, okay, I'm like, let's see if I can start matching up these particles. If Klansnick's in these environments uh, where these particles, uh, where these particles might be living that are on Tom Clay's analysis. So I, I was, that was my, uh, that was my road. I was like, man, this is where I need to, this is where I need to go down. Um, so, so I just I just went gung ho on the particles and just started looking started looking for uh, for patents. Any I know Camp Klansnick had some patents and stuff that he worked on the supersonic. Yeah, transport really project. really smart guy. So yeah, so I I just started looking into the different patents and different and different projects and stuff that he was involved in to see if I could match up some of these particles. And and then I remember the the newspaper reports would come out and say you know it's a possible DB Cooper linked to Boeing was coming out and right. that was before i guess anyone really realized that the the airline industry used alloy titanium right and it wasn't pure uh well, so i guess that, so, but that that it took a while for that to catch up and people started thinking well maybe not exactly boeing but 
one of its subsidiaries. Correct. So basically, they kind of came up with that because the SST project was using alloy titanium uh, <coughs> for their for the SST. Yeah, um, the supersonic alloy, transport, right? Correct. Yeah, there was no alloy titanium at all, from what I understand, that was found on the tie, and the SST was made mostly of uh, of uh, alloy titanium. So, you know, they kind of rid him off from working on the SST from that aspect. But when I was looking in the Klansnik, I learned that he was actually working on a specific program for the SST. And that was the hydraulic tubing. So he was working on that program, which was working with commercially pure titanium. Also, uh, also, alloy, also alloys as well. But they were doing stuff where they were actually machining titanium alloy not pure titanium but titanium alloy to stainless steel so that type of work that type of work was going on and Klansnick for this project was doing fusion welding uh, which there's different forms of fusion welding uh, but when I discovered uh, what type of fumes were in fusion welding um, I think I had at least a four, 14 particles from fusion uh, from fusion welding fumes that were uh, on Tom, on Tom K's tie analysis. So I'm like, oh man, there's th there could be something here. Like you know, he's 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 working with he's he's kind of doing he's in the that right, environment. You he's know, in he's that in that he's in he's in that environment doing the right things and wearing and most importantly wearing a clip on tie. So you know, kind of cup it all all that together. I'm like, well. You know, just because just because the, the SST was made out of mostly titanium alloy doesn't mean DB Cooper wasn't working in a more specialty area of the SST that supplied uh, for you know that yeah. were that was also working with pure titanium. So on the hydraulic tubing project, it also says on that report that they were also doing some testing with pure titanium. Um, and they list who they got titanium from. One of them on the list was actually RMI in uh, in Ohio, who we actually talked about uh, a lot. I know you're interested in them, especially with the ties Braden has. Yeah, um, obviously so he's from Ohio, and he's you know. So yeah, there's some stuff with him in the tie. But that, I mean, think you know, like even with Braden, you know, obviously if you have a suspect like you do and I do, you know, and the and you know about the tie, you're like, well, heck yeah, we're gonna look into it. You know, where where would my guy have come into contact with any of this stuff? And that's just natural. And obviously, you know, your suspect, you know, being a Boeing engineer. You know, it's a no brainer. You know, you're going to dig into that for sure. But, you know, you're always going to have critics, too. And we've talked, you know, I'm, you've talked about it with Eric when, in interviews with Eric Ulis and stuff. Uh, you know, people, a lot of people say, well, the tie is just a red herring. Uh, you know, he could have picked it up at a thrift shop. And I, you know, I think I think that's been kind of debunked for a lot of ways. You know, and I agree. I agree with you. Why would somebody like especially if you were even if, if you were an engineer that picked up these type particles and you're not db cooper would you really need the you know the the dollar they were going to give you at the thrift store to resell your tie i mean probably not you know uh so it you know it could be a red herring but you know he but it could be cooper's tie you know for whatever reason he right. you know, wanted to, to look that way which you know i mean maybe you can't rule it out so you definitely have to follow what we have which is this great analysis of all these particles and and whoever they tie to, if it doesn't, you know, come up to Klansnick or Braden or any, or anyone else, they could tie to someone that knew one of these guys, or maybe be that missing piece. But the more, we, you know, that that you, that you and Eric and guys that are really digging in and Tom to each one of these elements, which are, it's a bunch, and I'll put I'll put some of these up and we'll talk about it. You right know, it's on, not yeah. just the pure titanium; it's that high grade stainless steel, and it's finding what environment. Uh, could have picked up, you know, what environment would have produced most of this to to appear on this tie? And right. that's like, as soon as you find one where you think, okay, I've got it, it's got, you know, I can pick up five of these things. And then then you find out if you're in the environment that has the five things that you just found, then it should also have the six, which is not on the tie. And then it's exactly. just it's, it's nerve wracking. So it's, exactly. So it's kind of a puzzle you put together. You get some of these particles, but then there's like, okay, but then there will be this particle if these particles are here. Or, you know, so it's like you you're, you're, you kind of try to put these hands together, how Tom K says, right? You, you try to put a family yeah, tree. Yeah, like together. a poker hand, you know, like yeah, you're, you're exactly. shuffling and you you got three of a kind and a pair. And, yeah, that's a good you're that's a good analogy. You're constantly moving the deck with some of these particles to try to find the best fit. 
And, you know, that's what I've, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm very close. I haven't find exactly the right combo. So like to give an example, like, you know, I thought at first, cause it was TIG welding. That's one form of fusion welding, but TIG welding, uh, TIG welding doesn't really produce when I learned, doesn't really produce enough fumes, enough particles from, uh, from the vapor to really get on the tie. It's a pretty clean process. Um, but there's all, there's other fusion welding processes. There's electron beam welding. There's, um, um, <laughs> um, there's a few other pro there's a few other processes that are a little bit different and do create more smoke, more smoke and more vapor. So, you know, and back then they were doing a lot of just cutting edge kind of stuff, you know, research, you know, research and development type, type of, type of stuff. So it's like, you know, just because you look at something today and it's like, oh, they do this process with this, but maybe back then they didn't do that process with that material. So you mm. might expect to find that material if they were doing it like how they would today. So that's also kind of part of the rub is because they did stuff a lot differently back then. But, you know, there's, you know, that's why it's great that we have a different, a lot of different eyes looking at this. And I, I encourage anyone to try to, you know, look at the particles and see what kind of hand you've come up with uh, that might best fit. So, you know, I, I'm in I'm in the area of, you know, specialty metals, you know, research and development, because it is a wide array of, you know, different different specialty metals. You know, it's it's a unique it's a unique blend of them that, you know, if you can find the right process that kind of puts them all together or most of them together. And you, you, you know, you have like a patent of your suspect doing this. It's like, OK. You know, it might not yes. be the shoot. it might not be the parachute, it might not be the money, but hell, you know, in the court of public opinion, this is you know, it, it carry a lot of weight. And uh I so see you just put the 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 tie up there. Um so yeah, and I, and I was thinking, you know, that, that you know Eric Ulis did a great job. Also check out uh Eric Ulis's uh YouTube channel, it's under Eric Ulis U L I S has a lot of good DB Cooper stuff. And I have a link to Nikki's uh DB Cooper channel called Finding DB Cooper, of course. But I know Eric did some just some good background work, you know, on the tie itself. Yes, uh he did. and I think this is what Eric said, and this was from the video you did with Eric. Uh, I think he's it's a JC Penny Towncraft tie set, right? And it came with the mother of pearl tie clip. And then a tie tack, which Cooper didn't have a tie tack, right? He just had the mother of pearl tie clip and the tie itself. The tack was missing, but it looked like the tie the, the tack was on there at one point. And there then I think the uh, yes. I think Eric said that the tie was produced in the United States only, which points you know away from Cooper possibly in Canadian. But Eric said I think uh, produced from 1962 to 1964, and they know that because the actual apparatus, that little silver part that actually clips onto your to your shirt, that the tie clips onto your shirt from, was um, it was it had a patent on it. So that's how you know Eric found out when it was made exactly, which was from 62 to 64, and it was made in North Carolina and then exclusively sold at J.C. Penney's in the United States. So I think you know that was some pretty good you know basic background of the tie, and uh, you know obviously whoever bought it, Cooper uh, would have would have you know acquired it in 1962 to 64. So the tie's already about what you know seven or eight years old by the time Cooper jumps out of the plane. Right. And by all accounts, you know, the tie, the tie would look to be, you know, look to be worn, you know, pretty much like every, you know, every day to work for, for a good time period. I would say maybe, you know, just speculating, maybe up until a couple of years, uh, maybe a year to maybe two years before, before the skyjacking. And it, after, you know, after him wearing it for so long, it kind of became his most junky tie, kind of the bottom of the, uh, the bottom of the tie drawer. And when, you know, when it came to it, he's like, okay, this is my uh, junkiest clip on. Cause also clip on would have, you know, you're jumping from an airplane, you know, you don't, you don't want to tie and get caught on something, you know, just, just like probably he had it. For or or getting a fight and the guy's pulling on it or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. What, what if like, what if some, what if some, uh, some passengers or someone wanted to get froggy and they could have just, you know, grabbed them right from his tie and yanked them from his neck, you know, and then also you don't want that thing flapping around into your face. So just some, you know, just junky, easy tie that he can dispose of easily and quickly. So I think, you know, I think that's where he went to. Um, and like I said, it, uh, you brought up some good facts on the tie that Eric's uh, figured out, which is awesome. So we know like the lifespan of the tie. 
So it's like there's a certain window where you had to have been working with these particles because if you're working it, yeah, you can kind of nail it down. Yeah, you can yeah. nail down the timeline. You know, it wasn't in the 50s, we know. Uh, it had to have been probably in the early early to mid 60s where he's picking up all this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So like as early as as early as 62 and then, you know, all the way up until, you know, if you want to go as late up to a skyjacking. But, you know, there's there's a window there where he would have need he would have been wearing this tie and working, you know, with these specialty specialty metals, this, you know, this pure titanium. He would have been around machining and all this kind of stuff with the tie. So, you know, you're you're looking for for someone that kind of fits that bill with the clip on tie during that kind of time frame um, and then you also have a picture of the you know the obviously the, the raleigh filter tips uh the sky chefs uh, match matchbook and i remember uh uh cooper even asked tina for the for the matchbook back right and one of them, i don't know if it's the sky one there two was there another one other than the sky chefs and he had, he uh because she would she was lighting his cigarettes for him right and uh he said he wanted the matchbook back you know like he didn't even want to leave that i guess because he knew a fingerprint would be on it so he was just clean Yep, he was very he was very meticulous about getting some stuff back, but he did leave that he did leave that tie on his seat. Yeah, when I mean, do you think that was a mistake, or you know that brings me to my next question? Uh, do you think him leaving the tie was like a calling card? Ha ha ha, burned you, you know, like not to reference that book. There you go, Lisa. Uh, but uh, you know, do you think he did it on purpose because he took the briefcase with him? That was smart enough. He took it with him because I mean, maybe because he wanted people to never know it was a fake. Most people believe the briefcase bomb was obviously not actually able to blow up, but we'll never know because he took it with him. But do you think leaving the tie behind was just a mistake, or he just didn't care? It, it's it's certain it certainly makes you scratch your head and it certainly like gets you to kind of speculate because it's like you know he took all the other stuff back so it's like i can i can see him kind of in a rush um it is uh i think eric eric or somebody else i think eric or tom i think it might have been tom that pointed out it was he had all the cabin lights off uh uh turned off so it would have been dark in there black tie i think the seats were also like blue or dark colored right so if he put his if he put his tie down, just you know, kind of in the hustle and bustle of everything, you know, he might have just it might have just blended into the darkness, and he might have just he might have just forgot it, or he might have left it intentionally. Like I said, because you know that it that wasn't Cooper's mo to be you know lackadaisical with anything. Um, so you know, I, I kind of lean towards you know not by much, but I kind of lean towards he put it on the seat. As kind of um, as kind of a as kind of a symbolism. Yeah, be, like like he meant to do boot, it, like a, a calling a card, boot. you know. Yeah, kind of to symbolize. Oh, I'm a you know symbolize the working man. Uh, the you know the 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 blue the blue collar worker. Yeah, you I'm know? leaving the blue collar world behind because now I'm a rich man. You know, like the letter six. And uh, you know, I think that's probably what he could have been doing. And then obviously, also they found different elements of the tide that would prove that whoever owned it was a, a, an avid smoker, an avid cigarette smoker from, you know, the, the light, the light, the flint. And there was different elements there that, that would, would say this, this tie belonged to somebody that was a regular smoker. Yes. There's particles on the, on the knot, yttrium and other particles that are, that are in lighter flints that indicate he was a smoker. Uh, he smoked eight rally filter tip cigarettes. Last one to the nub. I, I read a file. Yeah, so this is a smoke. This is a smoker, obviously, and that's another thing when people say, "Well, he could have just grabbed a tie from anywhere." Second, third, you know, yeah, maybe that he he got a second hand or a stolen tie, and it just happened to be from another also, heavy also smoker. A, also a smoker, so you know, there's a link there. Yeah, that you know, yeah, like like it you bolsters it. Like you mentioned, no one's saving. A, Cooper had nothing. Cooper had no bill smaller than twenty when he walked into PDX. So you, you really think he's going to be trying to save a, a dollar or fifty cents for getting a a, a used clip on tie for for what? Yeah, yeah. Just it going does, to JC Penny, going to JC Penny, where it would have been more inconspicuous anyway, right? Because it's like you go into a thrift. Like I, first of all, I don't. I haven't even found thrift stores that said they even sold them. But it, you're more likely yeah, with would. someone rec recognizing you if you go in a thrift store. Um, it might recognize that experience just because they deal with less customers and stuff like that. Yeah. Where you go in JC Penny, you go into retail JC Penny. These people see it that you know they see people. Yeah, people it's, a cheap tie. it's like yeah, 
no, no one's ever going to remember. Oh yeah, I remember yeah. selling this guy up. You, you would throw it away before you you put it in a second hand. I mean, it literally, it'd be you know, it's it's it doesn't have much value at all, especially at the point. I mean, that tie was used. I mean, it was heavily used. I mean, wherever he wore it, he, he got it saw a long life. Probably right. was picked up in '62. It was already right. you know pushing ten years old. Yep, and and the uh, the other the the class uh, not the class the. Uh, the other part, the other part that went on the tie as well, like the you tie mentioned, tech. the tie tack part. Yeah, you, also- they could tell where that that tie tack was used. Like this picture, I'll put up. I had it where you could see where the tie tack was was used on that tie. I mean, obviously, pick, it wasn't yes. on there when they found it, but you could see the tie clip mark, uh, the first tie tack hole, second tie tack hole. So there's three places on the tie where that 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 uh, the 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 uh, tie tack was used or there's the tie clip mark is in the middle. Okay. And then there was two, two beside that where the tie tack was. Yep, exactly. So it's like, the, you know, the, the, the tie had some wear on there. Uh, like I said, it would, it, it Cooper, this either, either was Cooper's tie or, or somebody was, left it. Somebody or, else or, left it. Right. Or, or or somebody that knew or some or Cooper was somebody that knew was pretty close to the owner of this tie where he can just he can kind of just take it from him right so he either bought he either took it from someone probably he was close with that never said anything or never put two and two together or it, it was his tie or maybe a remote chance at a at a uh what do they call it like a rummage sale estate sale yeah. but that's just you know that's just and, how and- and another thing, and this this would you know bolsters the case that it, was, it was possibly Cooper's or was Cooper's that it had the original tie clip. I mean, if you've got this second hand or whatever, I mean, chances are it would have been already separated from the from the tie clip. Exactly. So it's you know Cooper bought it all at once, wore it all together. Yeah, because it came as a set, all three: the tie, yeah. the tie but, clip, and the and the tie tack was all right. three. Right, and you know one thing I brought up earlier on the uh, Facebook group today is like. You know why did the F- why did the FBI think it was so important to keep the tie as as some kind of identifier? Like, I saw that. Oh, yeah, I, that, yeah, because they were like you were talking about. Like at Boeing, they had pictures of the the DB Cooper sketches up, but they held back the the knowledge of the tie, which you said could have really helped back in the day. Like if they maybe were showing Cooper with the tie or or or, or pictures of the tie, like like you have here, and you know, does anyone notice anyone here that works at Boeing or wherever? That, that wore this particular tie. I mean, I'm sure they sold quite a few, but I mean, we're talking about 10 years later of, you know, if it was made in 62 or to 64, I mean, we're talking exactly. 1970, late 71, early 72. So not too many people probably had that specific tie with that class. Exactly. That's more, that's more the specific evidence. I'm like, what, what good is it going to do? Just given the sketch to Boeing to put around the bulletin boards when that looks like probably thousands of you know or at least hundreds of of employees that work at Boeing like I was looking at Boeing yearbooks <laughs> so so many Boeing yearbooks and different uh you know Boeing I'm like half of these guys resemble you know more than half of them resemble the sketch so yeah so that's when it really narrowed it down if like they look like the sketch and they were known to wear a tie like that exactly it, you know like oh yeah look he looks and like a smoker a and the mother of pearl and smoke, right? So this whole little this whole little thing here, the Rileys, the 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 um, you know, the blue the blue Sky Chef matches, it could have rang a bell to someone. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, if you smoked that brand of cigarette and wore that brand of tie, and you vaguely matched the description to it to an extent, we're we're getting somewhere. There, but there they did, a, but they held it. Why would they? Why would they do that? Right, because there had to been. I think there had to been some. When you put all that together, there had to been someone out there that had knowledge if it was brought to them. Of someone that wore a blood clip on tie with the mother pro tie class, smoke and smoked Riley cigarettes. Yeah, you're you're, you're right? narrowing and, it down. Even if, even if half the men at the time smoked, mm-hmm. you're still you got one out of two, right. and then smoked that brand. You're really narrowing it down, and then had that specific tie. Well, you you're getting your guy at that point. Exactly. So this wasn't brought to the public. All they got was this generic sketch that you know that looks like hundreds of people what you know what good is that what good is really that going to do you know i don't under like i guess they thought they were going to catch they were going to catch their man but uh that confidence uh that confidence really killed him because i think if they would have gave this evidence in the beginning like you don't even have to you don't even have to give it 
to all of the public, maybe just give it to Boeing. Like, just give it to places where people wore ties like this, you know? Like, you don't have to show it to the whole public, but, you know. Yeah, that, that you know, it's another, another misstep. I don't know why they did it, but... So going back to the elements on the tie, we know there was commercially pure titanium. And I know one element that, that you and Eric talk about a lot is also the high grade stainless steel that was found on there. And there was a spiral chip that maybe, you know, looked like it definitely came from a machining environment. But do you still do you still believe there's a high possibility that it came from uh, RMI, RMI metals in, in Ohio and Ashtabula, Ohio specifically? I know that you and I have talked about that. Do you think that? Since since um, we haven't mentioned this yet, and obviously you talk about it a lot, is that titanium that was found on the tie that was made with a specific process called the Hunter process, right? And RMI was one of the few plants that were making titanium using that specific process, which is what? It, that involves the salt? Exactly, yeah. So they're, uh, they're the only ones in the United States, and they, uh, they, they used the salt for their titanium process, which everybody else in the U.S., uh, was using the uh, curl process, which didn't use any kind of uh, NACL uh, in industrial salt for it. So, and and Tom Tom K actually, you know, has said on Darren on the Cooper on his Cooper Vortex that the uh, the salt was a, the salt was a match for the I RMI salt. So we have an exact match of a particle. <laughs> nice. We have exact. <laughs> There's you and you and the. Uh purveyor of the vortex right there that's the sub. i like that yeah so we have an exact uh like we have an exact particle match uh, according to tom k on, on the on the salt so rmi and ashtabula has you know a very a very strong link uh, as far as a possible uh destination for db cooper so you're um, still focused on that. I, I thought, I thought, you know, I thought that there was something, and I don't know where I read it or whatever that that it was a similar salt, or and it, and it definitely was close to the RMI uh, titanium, but it wasn't exact. Is that true? Yeah, or I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. I heard also. I also heard that. I need to get back with Tom K. But I think from what, what I remember last, it, it's pretty. It's pretty much just the the same salt. But there, you know, there's problems with RMI as well. Like I said, you know, with how do these other particles, all these other particles get there? But from what I've seen, the particles, the the the, the salt is consistent with with the RMI salt. Now it, it might not, you know, it might not mean that that same type of salt was used for other titanium processes and other, uh, you know, research and development metal plants that could have been also going on. We, we just, nobody, nobody knows yet, but it, it's, it's definitely a, a, an interesting clue. I know our Tom still likes RMI. Um, and I know, I know the FBI is, you know, still someone have an interest in rmi they actually called rmi so oh, you know really? I, I haven't yeah, yeah I, haven't. I know they tried to get records from rmi which is impossible because you know i know they've gotten we're in some trouble back you know years ago because they had to clean up that site and they did you know they did what they had to do but they were you know kind of had to clean that site up in ashtabula that was so nasty but yeah that was like you, you showed me some pictures or video of uh what those guys did there in ashtabula i mean you had this hot furnace and you know, I mean, you could yeah, really get, you get, I mean, that was a hazardous job just getting through the day, much less all the stuff you were exposed to working at a place like that. Oh my God. Did, did I send you that story about the guy that had uh, some, uh, yeah, a, a, a piece of something flew out and like, and burned his, burned a hole in his ankle. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, and brutal. Then, yeah. The guy telling his story and he's like, yeah, the next day I got his job. <laughs> I yeah, was like, exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. It was, uh, it wasn't a fun place to work, that's for sure. Yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah. but yeah, but R but RMI, there was a lot of salt found on the tie. Uh, that's one of the like one of the particles that was found in most abundance. So you gotta you you gotta square away the salt. Um, so you know RMI, I haven't ruled them out. I, I still got them in play. Uh, you know, we, I've actually found a couple interesting suspects from RMI that are still kind of. Uh, um under the radar um but yeah rmi is definitely still in play um i know uh ted braden has some interesting connections possibly to uh to that area and uh you know driving trucks 
possibly could be some connection to RMI. I, I know I found someone else that was mentioning they were driving trucks to RMI and transporting materials and stuff like that. So, yeah, it could be. I mean, you know, Braden could be for, you know, he, he tags off an address and, and for some reason his, his name tags off an address in Niles, Ohio, which is the home of RMI. Uh, you know, Ashtabula, I think it was like a two hour drive north from the plant in Niles, but I'm sure there was heavy trucking going back between Ashtabula and Niles because they're their home office or whatever. Just kind of weird. He tags off of that. But, uh, you know, you never know. But it's it's always good to try to tie your, your suspect into into that stuff if you can. But it does seem like there a lot of that stuff was in the Ohio River Valley, you know, where Braden lived. I mean, you know, for a long time, he lived in Pittsburgh. He lived in Chicago. But uh, you yeah, know, around were, that. Were, a lot of, yeah, lot of yeah. stuff. He worked for PPG. Uh, you know, he was driving for PPG for a while. And I mean, Pittsburgh, it, it stands for Pittsburgh plate glass, which is now they're known, more known for paints, but they had, they had chemical plants with you name it in it, including a plant that had, uh, that doing the, uh, uh, what you call it? The tube, the vacuum tubes and stuff. I mean, so, cause I know a lot of the elements found on the tie look like they were used in the production of cathode ray tubes, right? Like the, the green phosphors and stuff or like, right. uh, for optical glass. Um, yes. and they, PBG had a plant doing that, but I was going to ask you about that. I mean, a lot of that stuff, and I'm not, I know you've talked to metallurgists and all kinds of people that know a hell of a lot more than I do, but, in, and, and you learned, like, I thought that's, what's so great about you. You just say, I don't know this stuff, but I'm going to learn every bit of it. And you have, but does, does a lot of those elements that were found on there and the, the Macron labs analysis that they did, does that heavily point towards, uh, definitely where they were making cathode ray tubes or, or some kind of optical glass. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say definitely points to these particles are in cathode ray tubes, but they're also in other, they're also in other processes and, and other things as well. Like I said, it's not, well, you can make different hands with these particles. That's what I mean. So one hand is the cathode ray tubes because there, I think there was like three or four particles that were fought that were phosphorus particles. That were that would be like the yttrium and the um, the antimony. What how you say that one? The, is the that antimony, like a polishing the, agent? The, antim the antimony, which would be in glass. So there, you know, there's a little family there, right? The family tree. There's a little small family tree there that that could possibly point to, you know, uh, cathode cathode ray tubes. Um, and that's a, an also interesting angle I, I've looked at because for the uh, supersonic transport project, this was going to be the first plane airplane that was going to use um that was going to use you know like the nice screen displays and most likely they would have used uh you know a titanium to uh you know to map to match the aircraft so that's another tie into boeing and the sst where they were experimenting with cathode ray tubes uh for for their display on the uh <coughs> on the it's sst which, which never got off the ground um, but yeah, there are some particles there that point to cathode ray tube manufacturing. Um, but there's still these other, there's still other particles that, you know, again, he's like, okay, but if you're doing cathode ray man tube manufacturing, then you would expect to see some of these particles, which are not involved. So it's kind of yeah, like, always, you, like, like every, yeah, like, like uh, Tom always, said, it's always a different hand. Like you reshuffled and you had a full house. Now you've got a pair. Because you, you were trying to pick up this piece, but you had to give this card back. Yeah, exactly. So Tom speculated that the Tektronics, which is uh, in the uh, in the or in the Oregon area, they might have been helping out Boeing with you know getting some radar screens for this SST. Uh, Cooper might have been like in a late a liaison kind of between the two. That's you know that's that's a poss that's definitely a possibility. You know, so cathode ray tube manufacturing, it's still in play. That can be something that can be part of the can be part of the environment. There's some particles there to match. So, uh, yeah, I don't discount cathode ray tubes. I don't think it's a, a, a for sure. Like he had to have been in cathode ray tube manufacturing yeah, because nothing's 100 percent. He could have had these particles doing something, doing something else. Like I said, it's not a, it's not a one trick pony here. Those, those part, I found those particles in, you know, yttrium, stuff like that and other types of processes as well. So like I said, you can make some other hands with those particles, but uh, you know, the cathode ray tubes is, is definitely one of the, uh, one of the better ones we have out there to work with. Um, but don't, like don't all of these. The metallurgists look at this. Don't the, the, I know you've talked to some metallurgists and stuff, but have they looked at the, 
at the report that's on citizen sleuths.com and it shows yeah, I got, all these particles. They look at that and, and wonder to themselves, like, I don't know how the hell anyone would have picked up these, you know, the, all these particles together. Is that kind yeah. of the feeling or, or, you know, mm-hmm. like, or do I say, no, this must exist somewhere, which we know it does. They're there. They're not yeah. lying. You know, that microscope isn't lying, but do they like, is their mind blown by how somebody could have picked up all that stuff in night before night, you know, 1972. They're from the metallurgists I talked to. Their their mind's not blown at all. Um, you know, they, they they have different opinion. They, they the, the the opinions kind of vary a little bit on where they you know where they think what they think the source is or the ballpark. But from from the few guys that I've really been talking to a lot, it seems like you know metals research and development is where uh, you know it, somewhere down the line, either from the either from the beginning stage or more more down the line. It's 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 somewhere in there, but it's some it's somewhere that you're dealing with exotic metals. You're you know you're you're a chemist type. You're a, you're an engineer type. You're a manager, and you know you're doing you're doing these type of cutting edge exotic processes, and that's 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 what you're, that's what you're looking at. And you know there, we've identified different places where he might be from. You know, Tektronics, Boeing. Um, I know Eric's just recently found a place on the East Coast that he likes. Yeah, I know he liked Pratt and Whitney, and now he's kind of going further upstream, as he said. Like maybe, it, yeah, because they, they they make jet engines at Pratt and Whitney, and now he's thinking it could be like a, a supplier or vendor. Right. I ha- I have a list of all these places on uh, all these places on the West Coast, pre- starting with Precision Cast Parts, also there in the Oregon area. Right. So we can start pinpointing because in America, in in the United States, because with the tie actually tells us that Cooper bought. The tie in the United States because right. JC Penney's is not is not in Canada <laughs> or exactly. in Canada. So, so we can glean from that that most likely DB Cooper between sixty two and sixty four was working here in the states. Right, and you hear so right. much of this Canada stuff because the negotiable American currency and that that could be a fallacy. There's no it's, proof DB Cooper ever uttered those words. And some people I know on the on the in the groups will want to fight you over that, but uh, there's no proof of that. I mean. I know Bruce Smith doesn't believe that. He thought maybe the pilot kind of added that. It's a big you know, leap. negotiable, you know, negotiable America. Even even if even if uh, the hijacker was from Canada, why would you say American currency? Were they going to pay you in, in what were they going to pay you in Canadian dollars or something? I don't I don't know. It's just right. such it, a weird fallacy. People that means he's me, Canadian. To me, it just seems like just someone to, just someone doing a weird transcription, like someone just trying to make it sound official on the on the transcript, you know, kind of add in their own th- their own spin on it. Like I said, we don't know if that that actually came out of DB Cooper's mouth. So for for you to automatically jump to oh well, he's from Canada, that's a huge leap. That's 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 far from hard evidence to make that uh, to make that move. In in my opinion. But you know, yeah. I could see with with the Dan Cooper comic with the comic book, book, yeah. Which well, I don't know couple, how popular it was in Canada. It was. I mean, obviously, it was, it was French. It was French. It was written in French. It was, it's, you yeah, know, it Belgian. Was, it, it wasn't it was, popular. Yeah, it wasn't popular in Canada at all. I mean, it yeah. Was, I mean, obviously, you could find it in Belgium. Belgium. Nope. You know, I'm sure you could find Europe, it in Belgium where it was made. Europe, but you know, Belgium. You know, yeah, maybe in a few little nooks and crannies of Canada, some people would have been exposed to it, might have liked it. But you know, we're talking about. We're talking about very small exposure there in Canada, so that's kind of like become like a little Cooper myth, like as like a mini myth. Yeah, just got uh, perpetuated through say, the years. I, I want to say now, not to say Cooper didn't have ties to Canada. You know, you know, you got Vancouver, you got Vancouver right there from you know right there from uh, from Seattle. You know, he could have maybe after his heist, he could have went out. He could have he could have went over there. He might have had ties to Canada, living close by in the PNW, had friends there. Um, if you were working, the, if you were working in the aerospace industry uh, during that time, you would have been working with a lot of Canadians because in the mid '50s, the Avro Aero, which was the which was the Canadian fighter jet, that it, it was uh, such an awesome airplane. If you guys are in aviation, check out the Avro Aero. Uh, there's a movie on it. Uh, there's a good movie on it as well. It's up on YouTube. And this thing got canceled in the mid '50s, and you know, it, it all their all the engineers. This thing was. They say even today this thing's better than some of the uh, fighter jets they got, and basically all the engineers we got them. They came to NASA, they came to Boeing, they came to North Grumman. You know, I, I heard I read I heard there was guys from the states already setting up shop there, waiting for the guys uh, to come around, and they were already recruiting them. So Cooper, if he was working in the aerospace industry, which you know 
working with these metals and everything like that definitely points to some kind of aerospace, like I said, research and development metal shop. So yeah. you, you kind of work in that wheelhouse, you know, Cooper would have been acquainted with many Canadians, you know, maybe they, they got friendly. He liked them, stuff like that. So, you know, not to say he might not have had ties to Canada. You might like to vacation there. Um, you know, like Klasnik, he was a skier. He was a mountaineer and stuff like that. You know, I, I he took trips to Canada. So, you know, you're an active guy. Uh, you're in the Pacific Northwest. I can see why a lot of those guys would go out to uh, to Canada. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think Cooper was, was you know, one of them from Canada. I think that's a lot of just kind of just yeah, bad well. speculation there. I like that, man. It's like, I, I, cause you're my go-to guy for knowing everything, like every message board or anything Cooper. Like, I think I'm pretty good on the case just in general. And then I'm kind of a suspect driven guy, but you know, all those, all those details. So I'm always happy if I, if I know something or found something that you didn't already know. And one of those was uh, how Dwayne Ingram uh, came to find the Tina bar that we talked about. And I told you, cause I remember reading a, uh, an article about how he would take his German shepherd out there. That's why he was supposedly knew about the Tina bar where of course his eight year old son, Brian Ingram, who, uh, you know, better than I do. I know you've spoken to Brian a few times. I've only messaged with him a little bit. And by the way, Brian, where's my photo? I'm waiting for it. If you're watching Brian Ingram, I'm waiting for my photo of him holding my book. <laughs> but it's anyway, so that's, but that was cool that, that I found that, that I knew something that you didn't already know. So it always makes me happy because you know so much, but, uh, but that, See, that was, I, I teased telling people what, who George was. And of course, George, you found out because I knew about the German shepherd, but you asked Brian uh, about the German shepherd. And he said, yeah, that, that was our dog. His name was George. And he was an old police dog. And that's how uh, his dad came to, I guess that's how he knew about Tina bar. Cause he liked to take George, the German shepherd, who was an older dog, right? He was a retired police dog, I think. Yeah. So George was a retired police dog, according to what Brian told me. And he was kind of skittish around people and stuff. So what he told me was that uh, Dwayne would take him to Tina Bar because no one, you know, it's pretty secluded spot. You know, no one was scared. There. No one would spook the dog out on the Tina Bar, yeah. right? And being out, being out there, I totally get it. Like it totally makes sense because it's nice. It's very. You hear a dog barking now behind you. It's like perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there, there's a sign, right? That, that might be old George uh, speaking to us. Now. <laughs> So now yeah. people know who George is. That that's the Ingram's retired skittish police dog, and that's how uh, Dwayne Ingram came to know the Tina Bar, where his son found fifty eight hundred dollars of DB Cooper's money, which is a whole separate mystery. And you know, the Nikki knows all this stuff too, and the, all the theories about how the money could have gotten there. Of course, now I think everybody's kind of in agreement or coming to this agreement that the money had to be planted, right? With the the diatom oh, I, discovery. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say everyone's coming to this agreement. Um, I am. So everybody else did. <laughs> I mean, we're we're kind of you know we're in this kind of in that in that same boat in that same boat on that. But but yeah, George George's a funny story, man. You know, if if it might have uh, if it wasn't for George, maybe the Ingrams never find that money on Tina Bar. You know? Exactly. If it weren't for that, the retired skittish police dog George, we may, I mean, they may or never find that that money, or or maybe whoever you know, if it was planted by Cooper or an accomplice, maybe they would have come back and gotten it. And who knows? I mean, you know, if it weren't for the dog, we we may not have anything because that's the only thing that's turned up since the hijacking is well, obviously the tie elements is big, and then uh, the money. Yeah, those are the only two things we got to work with, you know. And if you want to dismiss the evidence, uh, you can. But then, well, you know, what else do we got to work with? You know what I'm saying? We got to take everything on face value, right? So the tie was Cooper's. The particles tell a story, right? I under, I understand, you know, people want to say, oh, a chain of custody. You know, it, it was it Yeah, was I've heard broken. that a few times. And, you know, I, I hear that argument. And, you know, there's definitely, you know, uh, some mystery behind behind the tie like everything else on uh, – you know, in this case, uh, from what I learned from uh, from talking to Bruce and from reading the uh, the, the 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 book from uh, Russ from Russ Kalami and uh, the two FBI agents that did the McCoy book, uh huh, right? Real McCoy, yeah, the real obviously, decoy. obviously <laughs> the real McCoy. McCoy was, yeah, obviously McCoy wasn't Cooper, but them being FBI agents, you know, they they kind of they, they got they got some nuggets of information, uh, you know, from us and. You know, it's it seems like you know no one even saw the tie. Uh, Tina didn't remember seeing the tie. Yeah, that's true. I was going to bring that up. I've, I've got a document, an FBI document, right in front of me, and it says 
Tina Mucklow, she said, noted black tie and tie tech was possibly his. Right. Is what so it Tina, says. Tina never, Tina never uh, said she actually saw, saw the, like the tie left on the plane. I don't know if she ever, ever like, if they ever asked her, was he actually wearing a tie? I, I haven't seen a file on that, but I saw a file that says she didn't act. She didn't see it. Didn't see it afterwards when, when she came. Cause she was like the first one, her and the crew were the first ones to check out the plane. So when they mm-hmm. checked out the plane before before the FBI agents came aboard, she didn't see it. And then the the FBI agents uh, assigned on the recovery that boarded three hundred five, they never saw it. So who actually saw it was Special uh, SAC Red Campbell. Huh. Um, and it's, yeah, and it's thought that, uh, he took the tie serendipitously uh, as he was the first to board the plane. So according to Bruce, Red Campbell somehow got on the plane first and beat Tina and everybody else to the aisles. And he grabbed it first. And that's why no one else ever saw it there laying around the, uh, uh, the chair or anything like that. Right. And then uh, supposedly the tie was kept. Uh, and then supposedly the, the, um, <laughs> the tie was kept, you know, as a secret, as a tell, we mentioned that. And I think it wasn't up until the late, 2000s or late 90s where they uh finally announced the actual tie yeah oh and exactly. then the, yeah and then the, t- the timeline so it, it, arriving in seattle um it added it, it arrived at seattle an evidence uh, evidence package i guess right i read somewhere but i forgot where that the tie arrived on monday november 29th thus the tie was unaccounted for for five days so you know, again, the, the the chain of custody totally like I, I understand that, but even with the chain of custody broken, how is this tie getting? Yeah, ex- ex- tie yeah from all these places. Yeah, they're built up over time. I mean, you couldn't have found all those elements in one environment immediately. I mean, this is he must have been in some kind of cross uh, right. environment he, to to pick up that many. Right, he, and that were that different. He picked up the tart the tie particles beforehand. Like you want to say, oh yeah, it's possible. Since chain of custody was broken, some FBI agent took it to a, a chemistry metals lab uh, just for uh, just for uh, craps and giggles to put it on. Uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> what are the odds yeah. of that? Uh, that that's that's too far fetched for me. I mean, right. uh, so no it's pun like, with George the dog, but that's that's too far fetched. I mean, yeah, they did lose the cigarettes, and I know according to Eric that they they were destroyed. It wasn't that they're just claiming they were lost, uh, which makes more sense that they would just destroy it because I mean if. But usually the FBI thought that would come into a court case like you had a, this great D.B. Cooper suspect. And they said, well, he's known to have always smoked uh, the Raleigh filter tip cigarette. So they but, you know, it more, makes more sense that they, they did destroy him, like Eric believes and said. And that, uh, you know, if they, if, if they bro- if the chain of custody was broken with the tie, it's not going to get broken. And somebody's running over to Ashton Bueller or somewhere and pick up all that stuff. It's just it's 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 uh, it's hard to believe. Yeah, it, w- what was found on the tie? If the chain, if it was just regular run-of-the-mill stuff found every day by every walking Joe that they could pick it up, I would say, okay, we can't put any stock into into the tie particles. But because these particles are so unusual, so unique, it's it's such a it, it's such a weird combination of all of all these different unique particles. You know, it's you you got you kind of have to just step back and think and just be like there's there's no way even with chain of custody that these particles would have gotten on the yeah, tie it's just, yeah they would have had to have worked overtime to go around i mean and then they wouldn't need to go to that if they were going to go to those links to to uh you know if they were going to contaminate it or somebody took it for a day down to their dad's work you know which couldn't have done it you know and they were just gonna think that at some point in the future this guy's gonna you know tom k is gonna come along after you know, uh, like what did, Tom K made it made it, it made good with with paintball, right? Didn't he invent like a paintball gun or something? Yeah, and Tom, then he got Tom into K this, which is great. Right? I'm so happy he did because he's, uh, yeah, he had the paintball, and then he got into to the DB Cooper case. Thank God for everybody involved because what he's done, you know, which is huge between the diatoms, the tie particles, but they never could have seen that coming where somebody was going to put this under electron microscope. And then the FBI was really open about letting them examine it. Yeah. So yeah, I don't I don't buy that I don't buy the chain of custody break on it at all. I yeah, agree yeah. with you 100. percent Again, so yeah, the whole the whole chain of custody thing, you know, what whatever. I I don't, I don't see what I don't see what that has to uh, what that has to do with the particles on the tie. 
Um, no, they, they had to have been on the, that tie, you know, pre hijacking for sure. I mean, it's just, it, it, there's just no way they weren't. Yeah. And then the diatoms on the bills, you know, that points, that points to a time where the money was in the water. So, you know, yeah. So it's, it, which proved that, that it couldn't have been buried during the winter when Cooper jumped or he landed in the water. So it's like, you know, these sign, these scientific things that we found, we, we got, we got to use. I mean, if you want to dismiss it, Go ahead and dismiss it, but then after that, we got nothing. You got nothing to work with. You got absolutely nothing to work with if you if you take out the diatoms and you take out the, the type articles. You absolutely got nothing to work with. Just pure speculation. Yeah, so, I, I agree. So Patty like, asked this question that Lisa answered. Says, yeah. "Was Cooper wearing a suit, pants, or sport coat?" It was definitely, a, according to the witnesses. I think. Uh, how do you say the guy's name? Labanchir? La- Laban? I mean, if you you'd probably know, but I, I never figured out how to pronounce that guy's name. That witness. And his name Levin, is George. So, uh, so, Le- Levin, Levin Sierra or something. Was that the yeah, lawyer? Levin Sierra. Yeah, his name is George, too. So now we have two, two Georges involved here in this yes, case. Yes, yes. But he said that uh, he was wearing a dark jacket like a blazer and a sporty vest beneath. So that, he gave one of the more detailed you know, examples. And then so did uh, Gregory. Um about yeah, but, what 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 Cooper's sport you know it looked like a sport definitely a sport coat that so it, it did I don't think the 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 uh, the coat matched the pants. Um, so from what we know, going from Mitchell, I, so Lebanair and those guys, any of the, any of the witnesses that were sitting toward that were sitting at the front of the airplane, I don't put very much stock into what they say. Um, one of them we we already know was outright was outright lying. Um, the guy Which that. One? The, the guy that was on the um on the oh Leonard, yeah yeah the, the uh, Simmons. Simmons Simmons right so Simmons yeah he, he lied because he he was yeah. on uh, unsolved mysteries where he specifically like oh the guy seemed pissed off or whatever when I went yeah, to the yeah, bathroom. He was, yeah yeah he, he was, was lying yeah he was on the Leonard Nimoy History Channel documentary in search of right that's right that's right and on, was, and on that doc of not on that doc, mysteries, right. yeah on that doc he was like he even said I saw his face um uh, and, and he said, and he said all these things, right? But turns out, when he got interviewed, right when he got off the plane, he had nothing to say to the FBI. Yeah, like didn't he say he never saw him or something like that, or either that or he would never recognize him, something statement like that. And then he gets on TV and oh yeah, I looked at him and he was mad and you know. In the FBI files, it, it has nothing. It has nothing of of the sort of what he said. And then by by Bill Mitchell's testimony. I take this. Bill Mitchell said they put me in the afterwards. They put us all in the in the lobby of the Pacific North, the Pacific Northwest lounge or whatever. Right. And then they're interviewing everybody. He was sitting towards the back. Right. And then they're they're interviewing everybody. And then they 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 got to him. And then once they were done, they let everybody else go except for him. And he, he heard he heard him talk. He's like the guy in the back. He knows something like keep him. But everybody mm-hmm. else. Everybody else, they let go. Yeah, they knew so they, they didn't have anything of value. Exactly. So the fact that they let everybody else go, including uh, in, including with Simmons, I means Simmons didn't have – if Simmons was telling them what he was telling uh, Nimoy in the History Channel doc, they would have kept him back with, uh, with, with Mitchell, you know, and they would have been asking him more questions. Yeah, that's right. So, and, again, there there's only one account of anybody – any passenger interacting with Cooper, and that was one passenger. Uh, it, they we might think it might be the cowboy. Um, yeah, with a magazine. Got, he was like something like, over a magazine or something. Right. He went. He went to go get a magazine. Um, and I think it might have been the same. I, I don't know if he went to use. There might have been two. I don't know if the same guy that went to get in a magazine also used the can and joked with Cooper and Tina that if we're if we're up here any longer, we're gonna have to get our Thanksgiving uh, turkeys up here. So yeah. There, so there was one, maybe, maybe possibly two of the passengers that had a brief interaction with Cooper when, when that one guy, if it was the same guy or not, went to get a magazine and went, you know when they went to the head. But yeah, again, they never found the cowboy. By the way, right? Did they ever find him? So Doc Edwards um, has has found a couple of guys that might have been him, but we uh, we still haven't uh, found the elusive uh, the elusive cowboy. Wow. But, 
not who yet, knows where but, he is. But but maybe yeah. but wasn't his I mean obviously but but looking at the, the passenger list, no one would have remembered or you know, of course Bill Mitchell wouldn't remember after all these years, like yeah, the, you know, because no one knew their names. I mean they're just passengers, so nobody's like had a name tag on. So and Mitchell no one will Mitchell, ever know. Mitchell had no interaction. Well, so because Mitchell stayed back, right? So he he came in, he came in late either uh, right before Cooper or right after, it's not even clear. But he had he had his coat. He had a bunch of his school books and stuff like that. So he sat down. He automatically yeah, put out his stuff. Everybody so, else was moved up. And, and, and Mitchell, I remember, he's, yeah, everybody moved up. But Mitchell didn't move up because he was already comfortable with his books laid out, like you said, and he didn't want to move. Exactly, yeah. So Mitchell didn't have any interactions with the passengers up front. And the passengers up front didn't have much interaction with Cooper except those two brief interest in, uh, incidents, as I saw in the file, when one guy was looking at the sports magazine and they kind of had a uh, Cooper thought he was like a, an air marshal um, and said something to Tina, you better not be an air marshal. And, and one yeah, guy he was worried about the marshals. Exactly. Right. And one guy that went to the bathroom, if I don't know if it was the same guy or not. And they made a joke with them about how long they were up there. Besides that, none of the passengers saw him, had any interactions. They stayed up front. So I don't put any, I don't put any weight into those testimonies. Yeah, um, yeah. Bill I Mitchell's, put a lot of weight into Bill Mitchell the, the day of. You know, of course, you and I are both big believers in the uh, the turkey neck uh, theory because that's just an honest description from a jealous college student. You know, I mean, and he they wrote that down the day it happened. They put FBI wrote down sagging chin. This wasn't something he thought of five years after the, the you know the hijacking. He told him that day. He remembered that. He remembered two things distinctively about Cooper. One, he had a sagging chin. Uh, because he was jealous of him because he didn't know why the, the the stews were you know talking to him so much. And the other was that Cooper spilled a drink, and the FBI wrote that down. They put spilled a drink as per Bill Mitchell. So he remembered, you know. I mean, because you know that's something you'd remember. I'd remember if I was on a flight that day if someone spilled a drink. He'd be like, oh, you're cleaning, you know. Well, because you're not look, you're you're not looking at him. You're 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 minding your own you're minding your own business. You're doing your own thing, right? And then for you know Mitchell was kind of bored there. He was doing homework, and then you know he kind of. He kind of lost interest in it, and then he started, you know, he started kind of uh, peeking over, and you know, that kind of caught his interest. And he's like, you know, what's going on? Why is this? Why is this old dude getting this much attention? So he's like, started sizing him up, yeah, and picking think, him apart, you know, like yeah, you know, he and that's and he knew he was older, you know, like he's older because Bill Mitchell is what 21, 22 maybe. <laughs> You know, yeah. that's why this middle-aged guy, why are they, you know, I'm this young, you know, athletic guy, you know, I think Bill Mitchell was what, 6'2". I know you met him, didn't you? You got to meet him yeah, when Bill, you were at CooperCon. That would have been awesome. Bill, yeah. Was Bill, that like Bill, one of the highlights is getting to meet him? Oh, yeah. That was that was probably my top highlight, you know, meeting Bill who actually, you know, sat right across from him, same, same aisle, you know, looked, looked him up and down. Actually saw the man, you know, with his yeah, own. He, he seems like a, ni- a super nice guy, and that was great work to <laughs> Eric to get him there. I mean, super, I mean fantastic because nice he yeah. turned it down before, right? Like he just couldn't make it, but finally he, I guess he thought for the for the fiftieth he was gonna you know give in and come. Yeah, he kind of for a few years there he was kind of over it, but he's like, oh, 50 years, I'll, I'll come back. And he did a great he did a great interview, I thought. And oh, I but, thought it was great. And I think you, were you the one that put that on the internet? Because for the people like me that didn't get to go, I would have loved to, but couldn't, but. Uh, somebody put m- most of it on the internet where we could watch it live. And I, and that's one of the parts I got to watch was, was Bill uh, being interviewed by Eric. Yeah. I don't know if I put it up or if it was one of the ones Eric put up. On you were the there, board. you were right yeah. in that area, you know, but, but then the suspect yeah. part started and, and I think you were part of that panel. So and then it all stopped. So I figured you were the one that were at least letting us see what we could see for yeah, a while. It, yeah. It was, it was, it was probably me, but yeah, you know, we gotta, gotta have built uh, beers with him afterwards. He hung out with the socials with us. He brought his actual, t- he brought his actual ticket, which was That's super, so cool, which was super cool. Cause his mom like kept all the stuff and he couldn't find it for a while, but he dug it up. For, that is, uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. And I, I saw the thing with the ticket. He, it's not protected. He does. It's just, he, it's like loose, isn't it? Like it's not even pr- like in one of those, you know, like you put well, a bunch of baseball yeah, cards he, in or something, you know? Yeah, no, he just had it in a, um, he just like had it like, plastic in a, in bag a, like, or a, something? like a, he had it just like in a sandwich bag. That's amazing. Um, a, I can't it, imagine what that's yeah. worth. I can't, yeah. I mean, a ticket from, from 305, knowing what some of the bills yeah. go for, what would a ticket from the flight go for? I mean, it was bills, I, I, not Coopers, I, I, but still. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the only one in existence besides the one. It's got to be ha- the one FBI has of Cooper. Everyone else, yeah, probably no one else would have thought to keep it. Oh yeah, they just trashed it that yeah, day. They, no one would have. I can't imagine what that would go for right now. They just trashed it. But yeah, so like I said, I I put I put emphasis on Bill's and Tina's testimony. Uh, Bill, like I said, uh, like you said, you know, uh, said he was older, uh, geek square, the turkey gobble. And, uh, you know, he noticed that his shoes didn't match his socks. Uh, that's pretty much what Bill picked up on. Um, uh, but he remembered details or else the FBI wouldn't have yeah. kept, him, and, kept and him. And they took and, and they wrote him down that day. More importantly, because I know Bill's honest today. He said, if you showed me pictures of suspects this many years later, I can't really help you. You could show him anybody. And he's just like, I can't. And I'll honestly tell you, because I don't remember, which, you know, which is interesting because we talked about uh, Airborne Bob and in the documentary with Colbert, when Tina, when Tina Muckla was looking at that table full of photographs of Robert Rackstraw, she dismissed him immediately. I mean, she didn't even, she didn't even ponder it. She was like, that's not the guy, you know, sorry. I mean, she like, like, like she really could remember. Exactly. And um <laughs> Like I said, like Tina couldn't, Tina couldn't recognize him. Same thing with Bill. You know, I had the opportunity to, you know, show Bill, you know, Klanzik's photo. I was just like, you know, after. after yeah, why not? I mean, you got him right in front of you. Have his audience, yeah. like, by the way, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, I was like, why? Uh, you know, after all these years, you know, there's. Yeah, no is he honestly? Be, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. You know, if I was by him, I wouldn't. Say, hey, man, this is Ted Braden. What do you think? You know, I mean, I wouldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I mean, I, yeah, especially you know, knowing you couldn't. Now, Tina's a different story when he was out there, you know, but uh, because like I said, she did seem to dispatch Rackstraw pretty, pretty quickly. Pretty, pretty, yeah, P- pretty darn quickly. So, you know, Tina, Tina's, flo- Tina's uh, testimony, fl- uh, <coughs> Bill's testimony, that's what I'm rolling with uh, as, as, as far as, um, you know, what DB Cooper wore and looked like and everything like that. So, you know, there's, you know, them saying his suit was russet and off color and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Now, uh, I just think he had just a regular black suit. Um, yeah. His black socks, tie. Yeah. Black tie, black suit, skinny, you know, skinny black tie. It's another thing, you know, Bill, Bill kept mentioning, you know, and he thought that was unfashionable too, because at that point people weren't wearing skinny, you know. Yeah, it was out of date. Well, we know it now, well, especially with the, you know, the tie was older. So maybe all of it was from the period of the 62 to 64, which already been, you know, 10 year old clothes. If the tie was, you know, anywhere same time period as the rest of his clothes. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So as, as far as to that question, you know, I would just say standard, standard black, standard black suit. He did have a, um, he did have like a trench, a trench coat type of uh, trench coat type of deal on as well over the top. Um, some is speculated because Mitchell uh, said that his socks didn't match his, his shoes that he might have had some like long johns on or something like that, which which would make sense, kind of kind of be smart, uh, you know. But but yeah, man, I know, but uh, I don't know. You you know it all, man. That's why like like I always like scramble to find anything you don't already know, you know, to to uh, pay you back for like all your knowledge and, and you're always being there to answer questions and stuff. And uh, I got a picture of Altire up there. I wanted to mention Altire passed, you know, passed away a few months ago. It was really sad. And that's yeah. one of my regrets, too, is, you know, uh, it's we didn't get Al recorded about his stories about, you know, Ted Braden and stuff, which would have been cool. But it you know, goes back to what you and Eric were talking about on Facebook about like you're doing now, like like him talking about that other company that he's looking at that may have served Pratt and Whitney. The fact that now's the time, because, you know, if Cooper is still alive or not alive or if you're right or, or we're right, wrong, whatever. Uh, people that remember this stuff are passing away, you know, like somebody you could have talked to. Like I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to Al Tire and get his whole story uh, before he pa- passed away. Cause I would not have expected him to, to, you know, he got, had a stroke. He passed away pretty early, but it's like you and Eric were talking about, you know, now is the time to find these people that still remember that might remember working at RMI and Ashtabula or knew James Klansnick or knew whoever, you know, or knew a guy that was wearing this tie. So the time is, you know, is now because these people are, you know, they're not here forever, unfortunately. And uh, with an already over 50 year old case, uh, you know, we got them, you know, it's time to make a move, which you, you're you doing, Eric's doing, uh, which is great. I mean, because you guys are constantly bang, you know, just on it. 
you know, just, just finding more leads and stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that was just, I, I really bought into, you know, you guys talking about that is, is, is now's the time because uh, those witnesses are just not, you know, these people that remember are going to be gone. They're, they're dying off. I uh, just, just, uh, I think what, a couple months, uh, just a couple months ago, Klansik's best friend, uh, John Shorky Sr. Yeah, I remember uh, you, you you were just, telling me yeah, about him and yeah, he just and he his just, best friend, right? Yeah, his like be- he, best friend just passed away a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, at ninety, uh, I think like at 90, 95, 95, 96 years old. And you know, I I never actually, uh, you know, I had his I had got his phone number from his grandson. Um, his son told me not to contact him. He's older, you know, not to bother him. So I respected that, you know, but it's just an example. It's like these guys, you know, all these people that have information, they're getting up there in age. Yeah. Um, it's just now's you know, the time to act. The like, window, you know, the now's the time to act the window. The window right now is, is short, but it's, you know, it, we're, we're in the age with technology and social media now that we can find these people and we can connect these with these people like never before. Yeah, it's like like you know, like yesterday I got to talk to Billy Wall, who's a legend, you know, and I knew, already knew you know some of the stuff he comments he made about Braden or whatever, but it was Bruce, mayor of Cooperville, uh, who's on the left here, and it's Billy Wall on the right, and said, Hey, you know, Billy's really approachable and in you know, Bruce contacted Billy years ago just doing research about Braden, whatever, and uh said he's really open, like here's you know, to, to try him out. And I did, you know, it was awesome, you know, to talk to a legend like Billy Wall, you know. Uh, anything, you know, Ted Braden aside, I'm talking to a legend here and he's 92. He's going to be 93 in December. You know, I hope he makes it as long as, you know, Jack Singlaw made it to a hundred, but, uh, man, I wanted to have that experience of talking to a legend like that, but while I had a chance, so I didn't want to wait, you know, so that, that kind of played into all that, like, you know, get a hold of this guy and talk to him while you can. I mean, uh, cause they're not going to be around forever. No, and they're, you know, someone like Billy Wall, I mean, he's just a wealth to be able to talk to somebody like that. I mean, with his, you know, with his, with his experience and his background, it's just like, there's not, pretty soon, there's not going to be any of these guys left. So None of them, but yeah, like with Sing Lob and, you know, I asked Billy Wall, you know, like, talking. you know, this guy was tracking Bin Laden. He got the first surveillance photos of Bin Laden. I mean, he could have taken him out, but they didn't want him to. Like, the way he told me was, uh... You know, if, if these guys didn't draw up the plan, you know, they didn't want me to get credit for it. They had to have it all by them. So they just wanted me to, to track him. He said, I could have killed him all year. He said, I could have taken out his vehicle, you know, put bombs on his vehicle. He goes, I was, he's so close to him, he could have thrown a rock and hit Bin Laden. And it was just surreal talking to a guy that had that experience, you know, uh, you know, but they're not going to be around long, especially now. I mean, because times have changed. I mean, everything's changed in the military, the rules of engagement. All this stuff. I mean, they just don't. They don't make them like that anymore. And uh, and we just want to interview anybody you can that's got any memories of of DB Cooper or or whatever you're interested in. You know that 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 these people aren't going to be around forever. Absolutely. And did you? Uh, I'm curious. Did you learn anything new from uh, from talking to Billy? Any new insights or revelations on on Ted Braden from your uh, your conversation or anything like that? Anything groundbreaking? You know, nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but I always get the sense that he knows more. Uh, you know, I asked him flat out, I said, Hey, Billy was Ted, was Ted B. Braden, DB Cooper. And he, he said, I suppose he was, was his exact answer to me. He goes, I suppose he was. And then I said, well, I know another uh, Mac B. Sog uh, told someone I know personally that he knew for a fact that Ted Braden was DB Cooper. Like he didn't think he was, he said he knew he was. And I told him, who the person was that said that comment. And he said, I know this person and uh, uh, you can take that on good authority. If he said it. So he kind of backed up the guy that said that he had inside knowledge. He said, I know that man. And uh, that guy knows what he's talking about, you know, without him being the one that did it. So, you know, guy's 92. I mean, his memory's still pretty good, but uh, he did remember Braden. But when I first brought up, brought up Braden, he had to think about it. Like who again? I said, Ted Braden. He goes, oh yeah. Cause you know, he goes, he goes, I'm 92. I've been through a lot. <laughs> but once he got going, he, he, he started, you know, getting back on it again. And uh, you know, so, you know, I didn't expect him to come out with anything hard and heavy, but it, but you know, but it was good. You know, he could have said, well, he could have been, you know, so at least I got a, a, I suppose, you know, I suppose so, which I, I was happy with that. Yeah. It seems like there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of that from all of the uh, SOG and, and, the, and those dudes, man, they all, you know, that's what's so intriguing about Braden is, you know, most of them say pretty confidently, if not 100% confidently, 
that they think Ted Braden was D.B. Cooper. Uh, yeah, they they do. I told Billy that. I said, man, they never give you a number two in special forces. They always they always stick with one guy. You know, that's what locked me into him. Uh, you know, and I'm yeah, I love what, the special forces stuff, yeah, but that's yeah, they never thought, they never give a second found, name. Yeah, that's what I found so interesting. I'm like, there's probably so many capable guys in the special forces. It's like they could yeah, have 1300 in SOG. I mean, in SOG alone, 1300 guys over the course of SOG. I mean, all those guys were were tough, yeah. could jump at night, they could jake it, they could all halo, they could uh, you know, they were hardcore dudes. Yeah, I would I would ex I would expect it to be like more what I've encountered on the old school skydivers and the skydiving community where everybody's naming a different jumper that they thought was DB Cooper. You know, I expect it to be more like that. But for every single person to say Ted Braden, Ted Braden, Ted Braden, Ted Braden. That's you know yeah, that gets my that gets my though. that gets my there's certain things that gets my ears perked you know that's it did it did to me for sure you know yeah. it really did I mean just why why do they you know and it's not because we as uh, you know former members of special forces or or MACV SOG just want to claim it because it's cool uh you know and they're and uh you know with Braden you know Braden deserted from Vietnam so it's not like you know for them you know they're they're, they're these patriotic fighters like Billy and the rest of them. Uh, you know, John these Plaster, guys, yeah. uh, you know, all these guys are you're very patriotic, uh, proud of their country. You know, Brayton was never there for, for, for patriotism. He didn't, he fought for, for money. Cause that's what he was good at. He didn't give, he didn't give, you know, to, to, to whatever about fighting for his country. He was over there for the money. That's right. That's why he, he contracted as a, a mercenary, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. In the Congo, yeah, crazy yeah. stuff. But, yeah, it was cool. It was cool talking to Billy. So, uh, you know, just, uh, thanks to Bruce. Uh, love the mayor of Cooperville, man. The guy is, is, is smart. And that's what I bring up again. I, I don't know if we talked about it uh, before the show or live, but Darren Schaefer uh, on the Book of Darren podcast now, his latest one, is interviewing the mayor of Cooperville, uh, Bruce Smith. And like I was, I think I told you, I only caught the middle part, but I was like, man, I can't wait to listen to this. It's like wait, two over two hours of Bruce Smith and all the bizarreness and crazy experiences that he has outside of DB Cooper. Bruce has had a really interesting life. Oh man. The guy's one of the most interesting, fascinating people I've ever met. Uh, amazing writer, amazing speaker, storyteller. Uh, yeah. After we get off this live, I'm, I'm going to go check out that, uh, that new episode of Book of Darren with him, the woo woo. Uh, Bruce Bruce is great. He's done so much for this. He's done so much for this case. Um, you know, uh, to move the case forward. A bunch of these guys have man. The whole community. Um, Tom K, Eric. You know you, uh, uh, Dave Feudman. You know all all these guys, man. Yeah, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark got so many. Uh, Marty. Marty, dude, um, we got we got so like we got so many guys like smart smart people um, that are all you know they have all kind of their little niche and you know what they're looking at and kind of their own perspectives and it's 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 gonna take it, it's gonna take crowdsourcing man and that, that's what's gonna solve the case like yeah I mean, and, you're, and, I, and you're like the you're the you're the tip of the spear you you are I mean you are man. the tip of the spear because I, I, I mean I, you don't miss I, anything I and you know all these guys. You know, I know you and Darren, but you know you. But you're my liaison to to the rest of the vortex. I mean, because you're you're like the vortex is this stealth submarine, and you're literally like like the rudder. You know, you're steering it, uh, <laughs> which is so cool. And another thing I wanted to mention that was really cool. I didn't want to forget to mention this. Your dad is into this case, which is so cool. And your dad knows this case. He's, your dad's name's Howard, and I see him on the stuff, and he's got like you know he knows it like that's so cool like my dad knows sports my dad's like 83 but but my dad you know probably didn't even remember db cooper you know and your dad's into it man that is really cool yeah man yeah i mean uh i kind of i kind of uh, got uh my dad my dad into it uh you know when i got into it but like you know he he's kind of always like you know he always watches like dateline in 2020 and you know he kind of he, he's kind of always like those you know human interest stories and mysteries and stuff like that and he was yeah, a natural. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got, you know, when I started getting into it, like I, you know, he's I probably talked to him about the case more than you know, more than anybody else. So I'm, you know, I'm always, you know, keeping him up to date of new stuff. He's always like, What's new? You know, every day I see him, he's like, What's new in the coop? What's new in the Cooper case? What's new in the Cooper case? You know, and I'm, he's always wanting to know the updates. And yeah, he's on the he's on the group giving his opinions. I, I love it, it's awesome. You know, uh our, our his dad cool. uh 
yeah, his dad, my grandfather, actually worked in uh, worked in aerospace. He was he was a foreman. Uh, he was big into aviation. I remember as a as a kid just seeing all these model. Uh, the, uh, he he was into the remote con- the uh, the gas powered. I think at that time the gas powered oh, yeah. air, remote control airplanes. The a yeah, I got a friend whose dad's whatever. totally into that. Yeah, dude, I, and I just remember seeing it in his garage all those airplanes as a kid. So that you know him kind of being in aerospace and in aviation. I guess you know I, I didn't really know I was into it that much until this whole. I got sucked into the Cooper Vortex and I'm like, man, you know, I, I'm, I, I didn't realize how much interest and passion I had for like aviation and aerospace and all that kind of stuff. So it's just like, it, it's been, uh, it's been definitely a, a, a interesting experience. Uh, you know, if you would have told me as a, as a little kid watching the unsolved mysteries, you know, that I'd be, uh, you know, one of the lead people now, 50 years from later, mm-hmm. trying to, trying to dog this guy, you know, I would have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it, man. But I'm, I'm you know, glad you are, though, man, because you're 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 my go-to, and you know we didn't even get to talk about two of the main things, and we you know, we'll do it again uh, to even cover it because you know you knew the the Heisen store break in, uh, the the Lake Elsinore where you live, the whole the sighting there by uh, Lyle Cameron and the stuff you found oh, out about yeah. Lyle Cameron. Yeah, I mean we, that that's huge, man. And when you were getting into that and telling me about it, and then you even found me a little lead. I mean that's how cool you are. You've got your own suspect, and you you know. Uh, asked me about you know hey did ted braden wear a cochran boots because that's what the you know the guy spotted law cameron at, at elsinore and then later i found out yeah he did so this is you know that was a nice little piece of circumstantial evidence for me that just shows you how cool you are you're like you know you just you have a suspect but you still love the whole case in general and you'll go where the facts lead and i'm the same way if it doesn't turn out to be braden i'm, I'm fine you know whatever you know i just want to see the case solved and uh and, and just you know the bigger thing is meeting cool people like you and darren and and just the community is just great just, yeah just just the collaboration man and all you know all the meeting of all the minds like you know when I first when i first came to the case and I, you know, I was going on, like, on so you know on the internet and stuff and how this case was being approached and it, it was it, you know it was just a bunch of old guys kind of fighting on on TV, yeah. on TV. that's why i never people, got um, into it man I, I read them you know i was like this like you know peep, peeping tom guy on right, those but i couldn't get because man it was brutal i mean it I, was I thought brutal, the zodiac bro. killer stuff was bad man i thought the zodiac people would get bad on reddit and stuff it's nothing compared to like it, it the fights brutal. that would go on was, and, and some of the abuse t- that bruce would take you know like oh man dude and these you know like george and some of these guys were yeah. like cutthroat it's like they were just they were just going at each other and it's like man why can't we just why can't these guys just share ideas and knock anytime anyone, you know, comes up with something, not get freaking uh, harassed and belittled and all this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's like, brutal. like, you're it's, like I can't be, you know, he can't yeah, be, it's like, he's this, it's he's like, that. It's like, you guys are just on in a debate mode. Just, you know, you're not even, you're not trying to get anywhere. You're just yeah, you trying can't, to, you know, if you're that you're bad soul say, on oh, your you're, guy or you can't, just, you know, it, yeah, it, it's a piss. It's a pissing contest going nowhere. Exactly. From, from seeing that coming on early on, I'm like, okay, this is not the way to do it, and this is why the case hasn't been solved. Yeah, so which like, I give a huge kudos to to Eric's uh, Facebook research group that you're a huge part of uh, because he, he's gotten rid of, you know, it doesn't allow the trolling. I mean, you can talk about your suspect and all that, but there's nobody that's, like, really wanting to kill you. That's Yeah, that's I, I don't care how wild or how crazy it may seem. Um, you know, every suspect, every book, every whatever, you know, there's there's some in everyone's perspective and everyone doing research there's something that can be learned if, as long as if people are actually doing genuine research and you you can and, and they put it out there we can learn we can learn from that you know that's if, it if, that, that's what crowdsourcing that, is that's 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 the bottom line so it's like you know if if i do end up solving this case it's not really it's a testament to it's a testament to everybody that's that's been involved in in the vortex from the beginning till that till the end because there's no way if i'm if i was just flying solo here there's no way i would even be anywhere close to i am right now that's because of everybody else's work um that that that's enabled me to kind of you know do the job i'm kind of doing now um but i wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for everybody else um and you know like i said crowdsourcing is the way man we we share information. You just not a competition. Exactly. Share it. Just, Find it. You share it. Just, Say, hey, what do you think? And, you know, even if it points your guy or you know it's somebody else's guy, and if you know if it it points to where it points to, 
you more, know, if it's legit stuff, yeah. say, hey, what do you think? The more eyeballs we have on things, the more brains we can have come together, the better. Because one person might find – might it, a light bulb might go off in someone, a click might go off in someone that it, anybody else looking at it just won't – it won't happen. Yeah, you know, I just mean, from their, their unique perspective. Everyone's got a unique perspective. And if they're genuinely – if they're generally, you know, interested and intrigued and, you know, not trying to, you know, sell a suspect or just here just to, you know, just to argue. I mean, that's fine. If your goal is just to, uh, you know, just to kind of just to kind of argue different little minute facts of the case that I mean, that's that's fine if that's your goal and your objective. But, you know, me and you, Drew, we want we want the truth. We want to know. We want the you truth. Know. I mean, you know, as long as it, yeah, we, that's all we want. I just we want to see it do, solved. We want, we want the truth. Chris, exactly. And as I think long as we'll, it's not Dwayne Weber, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just want to yeah, see it solved, really. I mean, yeah. even if even if it is Dwayne, really. Uh, even if it is Dwayne, but I, you know, I think me and you we're, we're willing to do whatever it takes to kind of facilitate that, and that you exactly. know that's that's why you're you know you're you're in my circle of you know of collaborators. That, yeah, you know, I, I love it, man. That, when we bounce I stuff share, off, and I, I want to know where the tie goes. Yeah, exactly, man. Because I know you know a lot about this case, and you know I might bring something up that you might oh, uh, you might know you you might yeah, know ring a bell. About like I remember yeah, reading I about that. <laughs> like the whole like the whole George German Shepherd thing. Like that's something yeah, I never, yeah. I mean I that, that, that was an obscure article that I read. I mean that was buried somewhere that I remembered that that, that indeed. And then and it was cool enough that you could get a hold of Brian so fast, and you were like. Hey Brian, did you guys have a German Shepherd? And sure enough, he said, "Yeah, we had the old George the Police Dog." So it's true. Just that's, uh, the, prime, it, that's the prime example of what I'm talking about. It's like you 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 find out some inf- some inf- random tidbit from reading some some random obscure article. You share that with me and with my connection. That I'm like, you know, then I vet that out. I'm like, did they really have a dog? Was it this, you know? This really, and yeah. I'm like, yeah. Is he really skittish? <laughs> yeah, with the article, right? Because you know how news articles can be. Like sometimes, oh, they're so oh, they're, I mean, even that were done during the time. They were there were so much misreporting. They were and even facts worse back then, I'm sure, dude. Yeah, they dude. didn't care. They were just like, oh, just throw it out. Just just get it, just get the story out. Don't make you know. Don't don't double check it. We don't have time. Yeah, exactly, man. No, that's 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 it, man. I love I love everything you've done. I mean, I love the stuff that you and I talk about, and it, most of what we talk about is not, not even really suspect driven. Most of the time, it's it's just these little nuances, like the money find or the tie or or you know anything like that, which is a, that's that's the fun part of it too. Yep, just exactly, just those just those little things. Because when you go looking at suspects, then you can okay, you know what more to look for when you're like scanning an obituary or you're scanning through you know, uh, newspaper art, you know, newspaper.com articles about him, you know, you're, you, you can, what you can look for certain things, you know, in, in that, that you can, uh, you can make better connections to, you know, Drew. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're both, you know, we're both doing a great job, man. And, uh, you know, I, I really think, uh, you know, we, we stay at it the way we are, man. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna shake something, we're gonna shake something loose, man. I, I really feel we are. I think we are too, man. And, uh, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. And I, I you know, and I just, I look forward to anything new you find and I'll just see anything I find. We'll keep doing it, man. But, uh, man, yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed you coming on. I mean, this has been great. I think everybody oh, yeah. really enjoyed the show. Yeah, I'm oh, glad yeah, we got to do it. Thanks, man. Yeah. We'll, we'll do another one for sure. Cause there's still, I had a we bunch got so of much. Things. We could we could do this for like twenty hours. I mean, I, I had a, I had a the, you know, yeah. the Heisen store or the or the Heisen you know store, any of this stuff. Any of that stuff, man. You know, I had a bunch of notes here still like on the tie and all that stuff that I didn't even touch on, man. But it's just like so much to talk about on this case. Yeah, I think everybody liked it though. I think we 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 presented it to them in a level that now they you know they understand kind of you know especially for you know new because there's always these newcomers you know that'll get on the Facebook group or. Or, you know, like Darren is brought in. Like, that's what I love about you and Darren. You're younger guys, you know. You're not like, you know, usually it's somebody that's got to be over 53 or something to to, uh, to know the case. But, with you know, guys like you and Darren have brought it to a whole new, you know, generation. Yeah, man. And, the, you know, that's like you, like we talked about earlier, the older generation is now passing passing away. So, you know, there might now we have to, you know, look to, towards the grand, you know, the grandkids. You know, maybe, you know, if we spark some kind of something in their mind and, you know, they find some the Riley, they find some old pack of Riley cigarettes or an old, an old mother uh, or an old uh, something that you know just kind of uh, 
just kind of sparks twenty dollar bill or yeah then they go then they go looking in their attic or something like that you know it's, that could be yeah that'd be great just to you know break like that the right, shoot just, a twenty dollar yeah, bill someone you know I, I truly believe now either TB Cooper is probably dead or he's knocking on death. Yeah, gotta but, be. Yeah, because he was alive. You know, if he was, you know, even even early forties. Yeah, he's already mid ninety. You're getting to be mid ninety. So, even yeah. if he's you know forty one, forty two, and, that, and seventy one, that brings up a stronger likelihood of somebody now saying something, right? Because when they're alive, you know, greater chance no one's gonna talk. But now after now after they're dead, there's a chance there's got to be someone out there that knows someone. Unless Cooper did this in a complete vacuum. Um, somebody out there knows somebody or a descendant of somebody knows something. That's you know? it. That's it. And, and the more we get it out, you know, they might, Hey, maybe somebody six months from now comes across this video and says, I, ah, yeah. Yes. I remember my, I remember my dad working with, with a uh, yttrium or pure titanium or like, you know, one of these weird or or my or Ashtabula or Whitney or any of this stuff. All of these stuff we're throwing out. It's just like to try to get something to, you know, to, to kind of yeah. take in someone's head, you know, but, but yeah, Drew, th thanks for having me on, man. It's, it's, uh, thanks, it's, man. Been a, it's been a pleasure brother. And uh, we'll, we'll have to do it again. We'll talk some more topics. Maybe get into uh, get into the Heisen store. Get into yeah, Heisen bit, store uh, and, and Lake Elsinore. You're the Lake, you know you're, the Lake you're neck in the woods. Signing. Yeah, the Lake Elsinore signing is also really intriguing, man. Um, so we'll get it. We'll do another live and uh, get in get into some more stuff. Um, I got my I got some stuff coming up on my channel down the pipe. I got a uh, yes, definitely go check out Nick, uh, Nikki's channel. There's a link to Nikki's channel in this description. Uh, it's the best way to get there. Click on that link and then remember to subscribe. Yeah, throw me a, uh, a subscription, and then I got I got I got Tom K's uh, diatom dia uh, analysis um, up on there uh, that he did at CooperCon, which were the uh, the algae that were found on uh, DB Cooper's money uh, within uh, I don't know well, last last year year and a half or so. Um, Great, great piece of, of new scientific evidence. Great presentation by Tom. Check that out. And then I also got three snippets of audio recordings from Flight 305 to Seattle. Yes, I was going to mention that. Those are great. Yes. Yeah, those are yeah, all on your YouTube channel. Air traffic control, indeed. That's um, fantastic. I, you got those. Yes, and I'm working on getting the full audio um, uploaded for you guys, which will be on my channel up here pretty soon. Um, so keep a lookout for that. So I'm going to be bringing that to you. The full correspondence between uh, Seattle Air Traffic Control and Flight 305. A lot of it's transcribed in the FBI files. Uh, I'm told there's still some, there's still a certain amount of time there that that that's not accounted for in the timeline. So I'm hoping we can learn Fantastic. something new there um, from the recordings. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to get that to you guys and. I'll have some content coming up and I'll be doing, doing more lives with you, Drew and some other stuff coming Absolutely. down. The line. So, so yeah, man, thanks for having me on kind of letting me, let me tell my story a little bit. Yeah, man, we're. Yeah. Uh, I learned about a lot you know, I already knew you and we talked a lot, but I learned a, a whole lot tonight that I did not know. That's what's up, brother. And like I said, my, my channel is finding DB Cooper and you know, I'm, I'm dedicated. I'm dedicated to the cause, man. I'm hoping we can find. You are, the truth. man. You're hitting. You're hitting it hard. I'm hoping we can find. Thank you, man. I'm hoping we can find this truth to this to this 50 year old mystery, man. It's 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 the big it's the big Kahuna. There's not a better true crime mystery out there that that remains unsolved. Yeah, it's it's uh, the best. You could argue, you could argue, you could argue Zodiac, and the, you know that's 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 a good one this too. This is different. This I, is I different. You know, it's 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 a lot. It's lighter. It's it's uh, yeah. Got all the entry. Nobody died, you know. Fortunately, I mean, it was just traumatic. You know, some people went, what what they went through, but you don't have, you know, there wasn't. No one was murdered, fortunately, and uh, yeah, you know, and this guy got away. We got to, you know, we can't let him get away. <laughs> it's not, man. The FBI, the FBI did. They they threw in the they threw in the towel. You know, I ain't I ain't about I ain't about to let that uh, to, to let uh, let that happen, man. At least no way, not happening. At least for public for public, you know. It, I'm probably never going to get a shoot or a $20 bill or anything like that. But, you know, if, if we can, you know, narrow this down into the, into the court of public opinion where it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, most people can agree is most likely this guy that, that that's still good enough for me, man. I just, I just, me even want, 
I just even wanted to get there, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'd be fine with that. You know, like the most, you know, most reasonable conclusion. Yeah, man. And thanks to all your viewers for tuning in. Yeah, thanks to everybody that that tuned in. Everybody in the chat, there was great comments. And a lot of people were saying, "Do it again, do it again." So, like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do it. another one, guys. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, man. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back and read the, the the comments later on here and see if I can uh, give you guys some replies. But yeah, man, it's uh, been a fun. Uh, a Drew Tube, uh, Drew Tube True Crime Saturday with you, brother. Definitely, man. Appreciate it, Nikki. Have a good night, man. Yeah, you too, brother. We'll be in touch. All right, thanks. Later, Drew.